Okay, we've hit the hour, so shall we kick off? Um, welcome everybody to this next section, session of the uh, Amaldi Conference. I hope you've been enjoying the week so far. Um, happy morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you happen to be. And um, so my name's Tamara Davis. I'm the host of the session this morning. Uh, very excited to hear the talks um, from this morning. And without further ado, I'll uh, get us to kick off uh, with William East, who's going to give us a talk um, for the first hour on strong gravity probes of the dark side. Take it away, William. Uh, thank you. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'd first like to thank uh, the organizers for putting together this uh, very interesting and, and uh, extensive conference, uh, as well as the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. So I'm going to start this session on particle physics by discussing a few of the many, many interesting ways that uh, gravitational waves can be used to look for new types of matter uh, that terrestrial experiments may have uh, so far failed to illuminate. So as we all know, uh, gravitational wave observations uh, have already uh, revolutionized our astrophysical understanding of uh, black holes and, and neutron stars. They've revealed uh, new populations of these objects that have uh, you know, previously remained uh, dark and, and in particular uncovered their mergers. Uh, but in this talk, uh, I want to discuss some of the ways we might uh, be able to use gravitational wave and, and multi-messenger observations as unique probes of other aspects of fundamental physics. Uh, in particular, to look for uh, new types of particles or even potentially shed some light on the uh, mystery of dark matter. So when looking for new particles, uh, one normally might think of something like the, the Large uh, Hadron Collider. You know, you build a higher and higher energy collider to look for more massive particles that are uh, strongly coupled to standard model matter. However, with uh, astrophysical observations and in particular strong gravity probes, uh, they can complement collider and then tabletop experiments and be used to look for new physics and regimes that uh, might be difficult or even uh, completely uh, inaccessible to terrestrial searches. Uh, in particular, they could uh, probe sort of the complementary part of parameter space of new particles that would sort of live down here and be uh, weakly coupled to the standard model. Uh, and even in the limit of assuming that uh, you know have some matter that that uh, you know has no no uh, coupling to the standard model, uh, we do expect it, it to gravitate because we can still probe it through gravity. And of course, you know the the dark matter that's been revealed through astrophysical and cosmological observations is an example of that. Uh, and there's been a lot of interest, in particular, on sort of uh, probing the the bottom left hand side of this plot, uh, which corresponds to uh, ultralight particles. Uh, these would be ones whose Compton wavelengths. Uh, would be uh, you know kilometer scale or, or larger, and this would correspond to the uh, the astro the sort of length scales of astrophysical compact objects. Uh, so this would include things like uh, the axion, which is proposed to solve the strong CP problem in uh, quantum chromodynamics, uh, or, or dark photons, or other uh, ultralight uh, degrees of freedom. So in this talk, I want to give a few examples that uh, you know sort of biased by my own interests of how beyond standard model uh, matter can unlock new strong gravity dynamics and give rise to a uh, gravitational and then multi-messenger signals. So uh, these images here sort of illustrate three uh, such uh, example ways in which this can occur. You could have uh, exotic compact objects that would form from new types of matter, and you can uh, look for them, for example, by trying to observe their mergers. Uh, you can have uh, the high densities and, and steep gravitational potentials of uh, neutron stars and use those as, as probes for new particles. Uh, or you could use the, the strong gravity and uh, potentially large reservoir of rotational energy of those spinning black holes as a way to like the new physics. Uh, and one thing that I want to sort of emphasize throughout is that you know having a good theoretical understanding of the potential observational signatures, uh, which often uh, involve relative physics or even nonlinear dynamics, uh, as well as uh, being able to sort of uh, design tailored searches that are formulated with these uh, signatures in mind. Uh, can be crucial to maximize the return from the observations and to be able to place uh, firm constraints uh, in the case that you don't see a signal. So I'd say in some of these areas of the field, we're, st we're still sort of in the early stages of exploring the basic phenomenology and making rough estimates. Uh, but in other areas, you know, through the efforts of uh, numerous researchers, uh, we're now able to make uh, detailed predictions and we've been in front of these with the, the latest observations. Uh, and of course, there's a, a lot of work that has to go into understanding and searching for a new gravitational wave signal. And so, you know, you might ask, you know, what makes it worth the effort if we're 
uh, not sure these things exist. Uh, so, you know, one argument is that given the, the gravitation wave observatories have already been built and the, the data has been taken, you know, it really behooves us to do as good a job as possible with the uh, with these tools to you know, look for a well made well motivated models of physics, you know, in particular ones that can uh, address other open questions uh, in other fields of physics. But I'd say in addition to that, you know, as someone who sort of comes from the gravitational physics camp, uh, another motivation is that these studies can really uh, reveal new aspects of strong gravity and then new insights into dynamical space time. You know, for example, how rotational energy can be liberated from a black hole or, you know, what kind of behavior is sort of within the realm of possibility and in compact object mergers. Uh, and even if these aren't manifested in nature in the particular form, you know, we first envisioned them, uh, the insights and tools uh, we developed still might uh, prove powerful in some related aspect, which you know, could actually be born on in, in nature. Uh, so one way that new matter can you know, uh, manifest gravitationally is by giving rise to uh, exotic types of uh, compact objects. So a particularly well-studied case of this is how uh, ultralight scalar or vector fields could uh, condense to gravitational cooling or, or some other mechanism and potentially form uh, what, what are known as uh, boson stars. So these uh, objects could potentially have uh, distinct properties from, from black holes and neutron stars, including uh, uh, in their maximum spin, uh, which could be uh, larger than the black holes and neutron stars, or how uh, they're tidally deformed in, in the presence of a, a companion. And if they're emerging binaries of such objects, uh, these would sort of uh, give unique signatures in their gravitational waveforms. So these objects have been uh, studied by a number of different researchers, you know, both with the idea of constraining specific uh, particle physics models, as well as with, uh, in some cases with a more uh, general motivation of exploring uh, what features could arise in exotic compact object mergers uh, using boson stars as a, as a fiducial model. Uh, so for that reason, you know, there's been sort of a whole slew of interesting work understanding the dynamics and stability of these objects. So there's, I would say there's still open questions regarding the potential formation channels and, and rates that uh, one would have. So just as a, a rather uh, extreme uh, illustration of the, the new dynamics can arise, uh, here's an animation uh, due to Neil Simonson from some recent work where he explored a, a binary boson star where the stars are rapidly spinning, uh, actually above uh, what a black hole or neutron star can have. And so this will be imprinted on the gravitational waves uh, signal from the end spiral. Uh, but this is also a case that will give uh, very interesting dynamics uh, at the merger. Uh, and, and in fact, what you see is that these spinning boson stars come together. Uh, they actually form non-spinning ones that are flung out, you know, which will give you quite a, a different and unique uh, post-merger signal, unlike that from a, from a black hole or, or neutron star binary. Uh, neutron stars can also act as uh, probes of, of dark matter. Uh, so, for example, one could consider uh, mergers of neutron stars with stars made from, uh, you know, axions or, or other uh, ultralight uh, uh, fields, and then look for some imprint on the dynamics or uh, molten messenger signals in a, in a neutron star merger. Uh, the high nuclear density of neutron stars also mean they might reveal some coupling between uh, nuclear matter and, and dark particles like the axion, which could uh, also uh, affect the, the binary neutron star in spiral uh, and give some uh, sort of extra interaction besides gravity there. Uh, another dark matter scenario that goes back to the, the 80s is that the uh, strong gravitational pull and a high density of a neutron star might actually allow them to capture and build up uh, dark matter in their cores. But in particular, uh, in some uh, asymmetric uh, uh, particle models, where the, the dark matter doesn't uh, easily uh, self-annihilate, uh, a star, a neutron star's gravity combined with the scattering off the dark matter particles uh, of in the scattering out the nucleons in the star's interior could actually cause dark matter particles to be captured and condensed uh, at the center of a neutron star uh, and eventually build up enough density that uh, they could potentially form a, a tiny black hole. Uh, they could have something, uh, a mass as small as uh, 10 to the minus eight times uh, the mass of the star. So for fun, let me show you an uh, animation of this uh, endoparasitic black hole scenario. And uh, you'll see where this uh, slightly gross name comes from. So here I'm showing you the sort of final few milliseconds uh, of this, this process where uh, black hole goes from being about uh, 1 100th the mass of the, the star uh, to totally consuming a, a rapidly rotating neutron star, uh, in this case with a, about a millisecond period. So the zoom in here uh, shows you uh, 
uh, that uh, zoom in on the black hole. Uh, you can see that it's, it's growing, and then eventually it consumes the uh, entire star with uh, essentially uh, no uh, material left over. So, you know, interestingly, this may be sort of an exotic way to get a black hole with the same mass as the neutron star, uh, which one could also look uh, for by observing uh, mergers in gravitational waves. So we can also use, uh, you know, black holes to probe uh, dark particles, uh, you know, besides trying to determine if uh, black holes themselves might be uh, responsible for, for some portion of the, the cosmological dark matter. So as, as mentioned, you know, one way to look for one way to, to do this is to look for uh, low mass black holes, uh, in particular by trying to observe the, the gravitational wave signals from the mergers. Uh, so black holes in the, the same mass range as neutron stars could arise in this uh, endoparasitic black hole scenario I just mentioned. And we could try to distinguish the presence of such black holes by the, the absence of uh, tidal effects in the in spiral gravitational waveform, as well as the uh, lack of electromagnetic counterparts in the aftermath of a merger. Uh, black holes potentially uh, of lower mass or, or even lower could arise if they're formed primordially, uh, as well as in uh, models of dissipative uh, dark matter. So in, in that later scenario, one imagines there's a whole uh, dark sector with its own chemistry that could give rise to a, a dark version of the, the Chandrasekhar mass, uh, potentially at a much lower value than the, the ordinary uh, Chandrasekhar mass, you know, allowing dark matter to collapse and, and form uh, low mass black holes. Uh, another way uh, to use black holes as probes for uh, new particles is to uh, black hole super radius, uh, which is what I'm going to focus on uh, in the rest of this talk. Uh, but before getting into that, uh, let me just mention that, of course, uh, many other examples of uh, strong gravity probes uh, for, for, for particle physics uh, and lots of interesting work in this regard, which I won't have a chance to mention. Uh, but if you're interested in, in uh, some of the many other examples, you might check out uh, the film mass reviews uh, from, uh, from about a year ago. Uh, however, for the, the sort of rest of this talk, I want to focus on one particular exciting uh, and uh, well-developed way to, to look for new particles with uh, black holes and gravitational waves, uh, and that's through uh, black hole super radius. So there's been a, a lot of work on this topic uh, going back many years now, uh, but here I'll, I'll highlight some uh, recent work uh, on accurately modeling the gravitational wave signal and then the relative physics regime uh, in order to try to go after the, the loudest signals. Uh, as well as exploring the effects that uh, nonlinear interactions can have. Uh, but before getting to that, uh, let me back up a little bit and uh, let's just recall what black hole super radiance is. So if we consider a wave, it could be uh, either electromagnetic or, or gravitational uh, and has some frequency omega uh, and it's impinging on, on the black hole horizon and creating some flux of energy and angular momentum uh, and, and energy. So if we uh, consider that, we can calculate uh, how this will change the area of the black hole's horizon. And if you do that, you get an expression that's proportional to what I have here. Uh, you have a term that's the change in the black hole's mass. And then you have one minus the ratio of the horizon frequency of the, the black hole uh, divided by the frequency of the wave omega. And that's uh, multiplied by uh, m, the azimuthal number of the wave. So this means that if the frequency of the wave is below a certain threshold, uh, this uh, second term here will actually be negative. Uh, but a, a fundamental property of black holes is that their horizon area should never decrease, it should only increase. And that's because in the, the language of, of black hole thermodynamics, uh, the black hole's area takes the, the role of entropy. So this is just a, a, the black hole version of the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, but the only way the area of the black hole can increase is if the uh, mass of the black hole uh, actually uh, decreases. So we have so this first term is uh, negative as well. Uh, so that means that instead of being totally absorbed as you might expect, uh, an impinging wave can actually extract energy and angular momentum from black holes. Uh, and if a black hole is, is rapidly spinning, uh, there's a large amount of energy that could, you know, in theory, be extracted this way. Uh, so uh, for a maximum rotating black hole, uh, up to 29% of the, the black hole's mass, uh, where this number would just come from the difference between the total gravitational mass of the black hole uh, and the so-called uh, irreducible mass, which would be proportional to the square root of the black hole uh, black hole uh, horizon's area. Uh, and if one considers extract, extracting uh, energy uh, at fixed frequency, so that's a fixed ratio of energy to angular momentum, 
uh, one gets a, a, a somewhat smaller number uh, that uh, have maximum rotational energy can that be that can be extracted about 10 percent of the mass of black hole, but still quite a lot of energy. So unlike so if instead of considering a massless uh, boson, one considers a massive bosonic field, uh, those can actually form uh, bound clouds around black holes. And if their frequency is less than this, the azimuth number m of the cloud times the black hole rise in frequency omega h, uh, then they will actually extract energy from the spinning black hole and they'll grow unstably through super radiance. So in this way, you know, black holes can actually act as particle detectors for ultralight particles whose Compton wavelength is comparable to the, the black hole's radius, uh, and that's when the instability acts the fastest. So this includes, you know, ultralight scalars like the, the QCD axion or ultralight vectors like a dark photon or other ultralight degrees of freedom uh, arising in, in theories of quantum gravity like uh, string theory. So if we assume only uh, gravitational interactions, the cloud will actually grow until the black hole is spun down enough uh, that the horizon frequency of the black hole matches the oscillation frequency of the cloud, which means that the cloud can gain a few percent of the black hole's mass. Uh, and then the, these oscillations will produce gravitational radiation. Uh, so here's an a animation here uh, showing you from a, a simulation of the, the saturation of the super radiant stability. Uh, and you can see that the, you know, the gravitational radiation is, is pretty simple. It's nearly monochromatic with very slowly changing amplitude. So we'll get into the details of how exactly it evolves uh, in a little bit. So there are uh, several ways one can you know, hope to uh, observe or uh, constrain ultralight bosons uh, using super radiance. So you can look for uh, indirect evidence of the super radiance ability by measuring black hole spin to see if they might have been uh, spun down. So you can use uh, observations of gravitational wave signals from merging black holes to try to uh, measure the black hole masses and spins and uh, the constituents of the binary. Uh, or you could also use measurements of spins coming from observations of uh, accretion disk electromagnetic observations. Uh, and if you know you measure a non-zero value for the black hole spin, then you can use that to rule out a, a certain uh, range of, of those masses. So uh, in this case, it's harder to make a discovery uh, without some sort of knowledge what the original black hole spin was. Uh, another promising avenue is to look for ultralight. Uh, bosons using gravitational waves coming from this dissipating boson cloud uh, with gravitational wave detectors. Someone could do uh, blind searches for uh, resolved gravitational waves coming from uh, you know, dissipating clouds around our black holes. Uh, and so this has been done by a number of different uh, groups, uh, you know, including uh, recently by the, the LIGO Virgo collaboration uh, using data from their, their third observing run. Uh, one can also imagine uh, searching for a stochastic background of gravitational waves coming from a whole population of, of dissipating boson clouds. So, and as an example of that, I have this uh, plot here from some uh, work uh, placing constraints on ultralight uh, vector bosons. Uh, and from this, you can see that instruments like LIGO will be primarily sensitive to uh, ultralight bosons in the sort of 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 12 electron volts range. So, one could help uh, hope to make a discovery this way. Uh, however, the sort of downside of these blind searches is that, you know, in the absence of a signal, you're uh, required to make uh, assumptions about the population statistics of black hole masses and spins to arrive at any constraints. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Uh, another possibility is to do uh, targeted searches by looking at specific spinning black holes. Uh, so, for example, we know that when two black holes merge, as we've uh, now observed many times in gravitational waves, uh, they create a newly formed uh, spinning black hole, which could be subject to this instability. So from the uh, in-spiral and merger gravitational waves, uh, you can have a good idea about what the properties of the remnant is, including you know, its mass and how far away it is. Uh, therefore, if you have a good theoretical model, uh, you should know exactly what kind of gravitational wave signal uh, you, uh, you should expect. So th this method is particularly promising because you have both discovery potential and in the absence of the signal, you have the ability to uh, place constraints from first principles uh, without needing to make uh, population assumptions about black holes or assumptions about, you know, accretion physics or things like that. Uh, the downside here is that, you know, merger events are, are rare and therefore tend to be at larger distances. Uh, and so far, these directed searches have not been actually, has not actually been performed. So an interesting question is, you know, can we actually do follow-up searches 
of merger events, they'll be sensitive, you know, with our current generation of gravitational wave detectors. Uh, and to do this, it turns out you need to, to target the loudest and most uh, relativistic gravitational wave sources, uh, and then you need a, a good model of the gravitational wave signal you expect. So uh, let's discuss in a little bit more detail uh, the gravitational wave uh, signal you expect from an ultralight boson cloud. Uh, so these have sort of become, you know, the other uh, major thing that continuous uh, wave search to target in addition to, to neutron stars with uh, mountains or, or other ellipticities. So you can uh, see the strain uh, in this plot here. There's the top two panels and the uh, gravitational wave frequency. That's the bottom two panels uh, here uh, from a gravitational wave signal that arrives around a binary uh, black hole merger limit like the first detected gravitational wave signal, uh, GW150914. Uh, so the, the panels on the left correspond to what would happen in the presence of a scalar boson with a particular mass, in this case, something like the 4 times 10 to the minus 13 electron volt, uh, while the ones on the right uh, show the exact same thing, but instead of for a scalar boson, for a vector boson. Uh, and here, uh, T equals 0 uh, would correspond to when the, the uh, final merger remnant forms. And uh, these actually come from a gravitational wave model that we put together uh, with the idea of having an easy to use waveform that's uh, fully relativistic uh, and therefore uh, valid for the, the lot of signals, including scalars and vectors. Uh, it's called SuperRad, and you know, besides having the awesome name, it's also publicly available. So you're welcome to uh, download it uh, and try it out. Uh, but from this plot, there are a couple of things to, to notice. So first we can see that the ultralight boson cloud uh, and hence the uh, amplitude of the gravitational wave signal uh, grows exponentially over time scale. So it's, so it's long compared to the uh, merger time scale is uh, short compared to the, the duration uh, of the signal. So you can see it growing here and then the signal decaying here. Uh, uh, you can also see that uh, compared to the scalar case, the vector case over here, is both faster uh, and louder. Notice the, the difference both in the x-axis. We have hours over here, we have years over here, uh, and the difference in the, uh, the y-axis, which is uh, about three years of magnitude uh, larger than the, the case on the left. And finally, we can notice that the gravitational wave signal from a uh, boson cloud uh, oscillating around a black hole is not exactly monochromatic. It's actually this uh, chirp up or increase in the, in the frequency as the gravitational wave signal evolves. Uh, and that's kind of the opposite of what you'd expect, uh, for example, for a, a neutron star with a mountain, which would be uh, spinning down. Uh, so if you're able to sort of see this frequency evolution, that would be uh, a sort of a good indication that you might be seeing this uh, super radiant stability. Uh, so the reason for this frequency uh, increase in the, the gravitational wave frequency is that there's a small redshift or, or decrease uh, in the frequency due to the cloud's self-gravity. And as the cloud dissipates, this uh, negative correction becomes less, uh, leading to an increase in, in frequency. So it's, you know, of course, not as dramatic as the, the chirp from a binary merger. Uh, and because of the length of the signal, this small frequency drift is actually what limits how long you can coherently integrate such a signal. With uh, the typical searches, uh, the one usually do that one uh, usually uh, does, assuming something like that f dot is less than 10 to the minus 11 uh, hertz per second. So in this plot here, you can see the accumulated phase shift in the gravitational wave signal uh, due to this uh, changing cloud mass frequency shift. Uh, and that's either over uh, the sort of characteristic time scale of the gravitational wave signal, those are the, the style lines here, uh, or over one year of observing time, in the case where that's uh, shorter. So those are the, the dashed lines here. Uh, and again, I'm showing this for scalar bosons. Those are the blue curves. And then vector bosons, those are the orange curves. So you can see that except for you know, non-relative scalar cases where you're observing for a much shorter time than the one over which the gravitational wave signal evolves, uh, it's important to take into account this, this frequency evolution, uh, or else uh, your uh, gravitational wave signal will have shifted by, uh, you know, many periods. And, you know, to sort of go after the loudest vector boson signal, you know, which would be sort of intermediate and time scale between uh, what you expect from a compact object coalescence and a typical uh, continuous wave signal, uh, you really need new search methods. 
So we've been working with some experts in, in these continuous wave searches who uh, have methods that can be used to, to go after these types of signals. And sort of the idea is to use an efficient algorithm that assumes the signal is coherent over a specified time scale, but allows the frequency to change in some specified way uh, in between coherence times. And we can use our, our gravitational wave model to sort of set the parameters of this uh, search algorithm in an optimal way. So in a talk later in the session, uh, Dana Jones will describe this work, uh, you know, in, including demonstrating the ability of algorithms to, to pick out these noisy signals from the data and, and showing with these types of searches, we should be sensitive to vector bose clouds uh, around typical merger remnants uh, with sort of the, the current generation of detectors. Uh, so I very much encourage you to, to stick around uh, for that talk to, to hear about that. Uh, just briefly, I want to say that, you know, so far I've been focusing on uh, stellar mass black holes and uh, ground-based uh, gravitational wave detector frequency ranges. Uh, but supermassive black holes and, and space-based detectors can also probe uh, even smaller mass uh, ultralight bosons, uh, sort of in the 10 to the minus 18 to 10 to the minus 15 electron volt range. Uh, and one can also look for either a stochastic background or a resolved source of gravitational waves. Uh, and one also has the possibility of, uh, you know, seeing the imprint uh, of the presence of the cloud on a binary inspiral, depending on the, the mass ratio. Uh, and for the case of vector bosons, again, it seems possible uh, that one might be able to uh, perform these follow-up searches of, of binary black hole merger, in this, in this case, uh, of supermassive black hole mergers. Uh, and again, this one sort of, again, this, uh, freeze one from the need to make assumptions about the black hole population. Uh, so the, the plot here shows uh, contour lines of uh, signal to noise uh, projected for, for LISA for uh, different mass black holes, that's on the x-axis, and uh, different luminosity distances on the y-axis for equivalently uh, redshift. Uh, and so the, the takeaway here is that LISA can be sensitive uh, up to you know, redshifts of, of you know, one or a few, uh, depending on the, the black hole mass. Uh, in my re remaining time, I want to mention another frontier in uh, black hole super uh, which uh, many groups have been working on lately, uh, which is exploring the effect of non-gravitational interactions. So if we just assume a massive boson that interacts uh, gravitationally, uh, then the super instability instability uh, saturates just by spinning down the black hole until the horizon frequency of the black hole uh, matches the horizon frequency of the cloud. So that's, that's shown here, this is a black hole frequency uh, decreasing until it matches the frequency of the cloud. Uh, and then the um, sort of longer time scales, the cloud dissipates by gravitational waves. And so what we found is that this nonlinear process all happens sort of quasi adiabatically, uh, even when you're considering relativistic cases, uh, or even when you're extracting up to 10% of the black hole's mass, uh, as shown on the plot on the left here. Uh, however, if the bosonic field has nonlinear interactions, uh, either with itself or with other fields, uh, then other interesting things might happen. Uh, and in particular for the, the more relativistic cases where the, the cloud sits closer to the black hole and has higher densities, uh, it's easy to uh, envision scenarios where these interactions could uh, eventually come, become important as the cloud uh, grows these higher energy densities. So when uh, considering the role of uh, nonlinear interactions, you know, there are a number of important questions to ask. So one possibility is that the nonlinear actions can cause the uh, saturation of super instability to happen at lower field values uh, due to some combination of radiation, uh, dissipation into other states, uh, and uh, possibly black hole absorption. So this uh, will, of course, you know, affect how strong a gravitational wave signal one expects and, and how fast the, the black hole spin down occurs. So one wants to know uh, if and, and when this happens. And if it does happen, uh, another question is whether the instability sort of uh, smoothly saturates as it does for the gravitational back direction case, uh, or whether there might be some explosive phenomena due to uh, nonlinear attraction. So in the specific uh, context of the axion, uh, the later possibility uh, was dubbed a, a Bose nova, uh, sort of borrowing terminology from, from Bose Einstein condensate, uh, which itself uh, was a bit of play on words with the genre of Brazilian music, uh, Bose nova. Uh, so, however, in some uh, more recent work on the, on the role of uh, self-interactions in the, the case of a scalar boson, uh, this work seems to indicate that the Bose-Nova scenario, scenario might not actually happen, uh, since nonlinear processes which uh, populate 
uh, multiple down levels actually uh, halt the, the growth of the cloud in a, in a sort of quasi equilibrium uh, before anything dramatic happens. So that's uh, shown in this plot here by uh, Barry Ector et al, where they were looking at uh, cortex scalar interactions uh, and uh, uh, scalar super radiance. Uh, however, I want to discuss a little bit the vector case, uh, which turns out to be different and where you actually do get uh, you know, dramatic and, and explosive dynamics. Uh, I'm also gonna discuss a little bit the uh, possibility uh, that you know, even if they are strong enough to dramatically change the evolution of the super radiance cloud, one could have uh, interactions with the standard uh, model that could give rise to new observables uh, and actually make the, the super radiance clouds into a multi-messenger system. So I'll briefly describe uh, an example of a scenario where that occurs uh, in the dark photon. So if, you're, if we're uh, talking about nonlinear interactions for, for a massive vector, uh, a concrete and, and rather natural example is to take the dark photon with the Higgs mechanism. So in the, the standard model, you know, particles get masses through their interaction with the Higgs boson, uh, which uh, has a, a non-zero vacuum expectation value uh, that leads to a spontaneously broken symmetry. So uh, the idea here is to imagine that you have a, a U1 uh, dark photon that gets its mass in the same way, uh, that's by being coupled to a, a complex scalar phi that has this uh, Higgs-like uh, potential. So here, this would be distinct from the, the standard model Higgs. So as you can see on the plot on the left, uh, you know, at small uh, vector field values, the scalar wants to just sit at its uh, vacuum expectation value, which I'm calling uh, V. And this leads the dark photon to have a non-zero mass, and thus it could grow uh, exponentially uh, through super radiance. Uh, but as the, the cloud grows, uh, the, the vector field actually gives a contribution to the scalar's sort of effective potential. Uh, and this will uh, want, want to push the scalar field uh, away from uh, its minimum to uh, lower and lower uh, field magnitude. And so in this, this plot on the right, I'm showing you uh, what happens in this case as the vector field grows exponentially uh, actually pushes phi uh, to go to zero towards this uh, symmetry restoration point in some places in the cloud, and you have extreme nonlinear dynamics that actually disrupt the, the super radiance growth of the cloud. So in fact, what happens is that you uh, develop uh, spring vortices, that is a uh, one-dimensional curves where the, the scalar field goes to zero, uh, but its complex phase goes to uh, two pi when you go around the string. So I'm gonna show you an uh, animation here uh, of the uh, complex phase of the, the scalar field in the equatorial plane, uh, that's your equatorial plane of the, the black hole. Uh, and as the cloud grows, you'll see these several string leaks form. So here, green contours will indicate uh, around values where the, the scalar field magnitude goes to zero. So you can see you get these two vortex, anti-vortex pairs, uh, and one goes out, one, uh, one immediately falls back to the black hole, and then they, they both fall back in the black hole. So this is sort of uh, you know, completely analogous to uh, cosmic strings that people speculate about being formed in the uh, early universe, but here you're uh, sort of forming them dynamically around a, a black hole uh, on these much smaller scales. Uh, so let me show you uh, another animation of this process, this time showing you uh, what happens to the energy density in this, this vector boson cloud. Uh, so as the, the cloud goes through super radiance, Again, you'll see these uh, strings form as indicated by uh, the green contours. Uh, but here you'll see that the strings actually mediate the disruption of the cloud with a large portion of the energy being uh, radiated away in the boson uh, and another portion falling back into the black hole. And then after the strings disappear, uh, at the end you can notice that the, the cloud uh, eventually settles down and then it can start growing again uh, through super radiance. So this is uh, you know, similar to what I hypothesized for the, the action case, uh, but here the, the nonlinear dynamics are, are quite a big difference. So I'm calling here this, uh, I'm calling this a stringy bosonova. So the, the conclusion is that the, uh, Higgs, the Higgs abelian model, uh, you know, for some range of parameters, uh, this, in this model, the saturation of the super instability will actually occur not through gravitational interactions, uh, you know, that is by spinning down the black hole, but through this, this stringy bosonova. And this can lead to this uh, episodic burst-like behavior where the, the cloud 
you know, grows, uh, then it's partially disrupted, and then grows again. Uh, and this can potentially repeat, you know, as long as the, the black hole's rotational energy can, can power the growth of the cloud. Uh, in, in some work with my uh, collaborator, uh, John Yu Huang, we explored the phenomenology of vortex formation. Uh, and we found that for values of the parameters that uh, make the string radius uh, very small compared uh, to the cloud size, which, which is something that's a bit difficult to, to tackle with the simulations, they might actually expect to create a huge number of loops, uh, say something like 10 to the 40, uh, which would be moving relativistically and interacting. So it's possible some uh, non-negligible fraction of them could actually become unbound from the black hole. Uh, so this could lead to sort of a different sort of gravitational wave signal from the loops decaying, uh, or these these uh, loops could also potentially be detected with uh, some interaction with the uh, standard model for them. Uh, another thing we, we realized is that the, this uh, vortex formation would uh, also arise in many production scenarios uh, for U1 uh, dark photon dark matter, uh, and there it sort of completely changed the expected dynamics uh, in a way that, that needs to be taken into account when considering such uh, dark matter models. Uh, so just before closing, uh, I want to mention a different type of interaction for the, the dark photon, uh, which can turn these uh, uh, black hole dark photon cloud systems into multi-messenger sources. So uh, now setting aside the, the higgs abelian model, uh, in the context of a, a dark photon, it's also natural to consider a small uh, kinetic mixing with the uh, standard model photon. Uh, so that's a, that's a term of this type, uh, mixing the you know, Faraday tensor of the, the dark photon with the ordinary photon. Uh, and then this, this uh, mixing has some dimensionless parameter epsilon, uh, which will be small, uh, that, that determines the, the strength of this, uh, this uh, coupling. Uh, so in this case, you can sort of think of it as that the massive vector, uh, which is the one that will uh, grow through superradiance, will have a small coupling with uh, electrons and, and, and positrons that's parameterized by epsilon. And that means that if a large uh, vector boson cloud grows around a black hole through superradiance, uh, this will lead to the development of a large electric field, uh, you know, even considering uh, values of epsilon that are uh, not observationally excluded. Uh, and this oscillating electric field uh, uh, so will have you know, frequency that's approximately equal to the, the vector boson mass. Uh, so in some work uh, led by uh, Neil Simonson and, and these collaborators, uh, what we found is this will create uh, a plasma sort of similar to what happens in the magnetosphere of a pulsar or uh, in the vicinity of a relativistic black hole jet. And that the superated uh, vector cloud can actually dissipate energy into this, this, this uh, paraplasma, including through magnetic reflection and, and, uh, and electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so for most of the primary states of interest, the, the you know, electromagnetic dissipation will sort of be, still be subdominant to the gravitational emission. So the, the gravitational wave emission will still set the decay time for the cloud. Uh, but this, you know, turbulent, uh, highly magnetized plasma can lead to a high energy electromagnetic transient would be powered by the, the boson cloud uh, without affecting the, the superating growth and saturation. So, uh, you know, we expect this emission to have a, a strong X-ray component uh, and uh, potentially to uh, be quite luminous uh, with sort of the, the upper bound for the luminosity be something like uh, 10 to the 43 ergs per second, uh, taking the, the maximally uh, observationally allowed uh, value to kinetic mixing. So an, another way to uh, you know identify these systems is to go out and look for electromagnetic transient from a, a binary merger remnant. Uh, since again, this you know oscillating this oscillation period and the growth and decay time of the cloud will all sort of uniquely be set by the boson uh, mass in combination with the, the black hole properties. Uh, intriguingly, uh, one could also consider looking for a superage gravitational wave signal uh, from some select uh, putative pulsars, uh, as for uh, uh, certain uh, ranges of boson mass, the, the oscillation period the, uh, set by the boson mass would overlap with pulsar periods. And the electromagnetic emission mechanism seems to uh, you know, at least have some, some qualitative similarity. So to, uh, to summarize this uh, section on black hole superbrains, uh, gravitational waves uh, are a powerful probe to search for ultralight bosons through the, the superbrains ability. And we can leverage uh, good theoretical models to design more sensitive searches and uh, place more stringent constraints uh, in, in the absence of, of a detection. 
So we'll hear uh, more about this later in the session. I'm, I'm excited about that, uh, including uh, exciting prospects for in the near future for being able to perform uh, follow-up searches for uh, O2I vectors from, from merger events. Uh, another new frontier in this area is to you know, figure out how uh, self interactions or, or coupling uh, to other matter alter this picture, uh, including and how they give rise to you know rich new dynam uh, sorry rich new dynamics like the the stringy bosonova and uh, new observational signatures like uh, this high energy electromagnetic emission uh, that would be an electromagnetic counterpart to the gravitational wave signal from a, a dark photon. In this scenario, we have a kinetic mixing with the ordinary photon. Uh, so I, I believe the, the road ahead will be uh, exciting for this area uh, to sort of pictorially represent that. I've included here uh, a picture uh, from a Canada Day Parade I went to uh, earliest month where I saw a uh, Chevy Nova that if you look closely has uh, a Bosonova license plate. But um, you know, maybe if we're lucky, uh, Bosonova will be something we can see in, in the, the sky as well. Uh, so to conclude, you know, in, in general, uh, gravitational waves and, and compact objects can be powerful probes of the dark sector, uh, you know, complementing experiments we can do on Earth. And, you know, understanding the, the strong uh, gravity dynamics that are uh, unlocked by, the, by these, new series, these uh, new scenarios, I think, can also provide new insights uh, into the you know, fundamental dynamics of space time as well, which is also very exciting. So uh, let me uh, end here. and. Uh, Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, William. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's remarkable to think sometimes just how far we've come from observing the world with our naked eyes and senses uh, to the stage of where looking for these kinds of things. Um, okay, we have um, a lot of time for questions. If you're interested in asking a question, please put your hand up in the um, chat. There's the raise hand button at the bottom or you can type a question in the Q&A uh, and I can read that out for you. So, um, Vladimir, do you, would you like to um, um, read your chat out or your question out? I've just unmuted you. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm, yep. yep. Oh, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I have a quick question. Earlier on, you uh, showed the plot which with gigaparsec detection distances for uh, um, uh, was it for vector bosons? Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, so that would be uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So this would be this would be for vector bosons, and so um, actually this this will. will uh, if you stay tuned in this session, you'll hear the, the details of, of this uh, mm -hmm. in, in uh, Dana Jones's talk. So yeah, this, that's, that's where that goes on. Great. Um, does anyone else have um, a, any qu more questions? Um, I have uh, a couple, if, but I'll ask you, see if I... Um, permit, permit myself to answer, ask a question here. Um, way back early on when you were talking about when you're introducing super radiance, you introduced it with an entropy argument. Um, yeah. I was wondering if there is any scope for the for entropy to be carried away by the things outside the black hole so that the entropy could remain high even if the area um, goes down. So as in the case when you have Hawking radiation, for example. Uh, yeah, so, uh, right, right, so, yeah, so, I mean, one can certainly imagine, like, the, uh, the entropy of the, you know, combined system that would include, include, like, mm -hmm. the, the black hole or, uh, and, uh, some, some other, uh, fields or, or matter, uh, but th this, 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 um, uh, you know, black hole area increase law, uh, you know, that we can certainly derive it from, from uh, black hole thermodynamics uh, is also just a sort of a, a classical property of, of black holes uh, given some certain uh, energy conditions. So yeah, that, I think that's a, an interesting question. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I have one more, but I'll just check if there's any other questions online first. Anyone? Uh, if not, 
Then my, my other question was about the, the clouds that you're talking about here. And what, I was just trying to understand a little bit more of the details of how they, they form and what they're made of and how they spin. And for example, you were saying that the black hole spins down until it reaches the frequency of the cloud. And was that like the orbital frequency um, that you're talking about there? And so I was wondering if you could just describe the clouds a little bit more. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the clouds are you know, oscillating at some frequency uh, that to, to sort of zeroth order is, is just uh, uh, given by the, the mass of the boson. So it's just sort of the natural oscillation frequency uh, that's equal to the, the boson mass. Uh, and so that, that would be this uh, omega here for this, this case. And basically, uh, as, the, as the black hole loses uh, energy and angular momentum, uh, the horizon frequency omega h will uh, will decrease, uh, and eventually it'll be approximately uh, equal. You know, m times uh, omega uh, black hole will, or big omega black hole, will be equal to the oscillation frequency of the cloud. Uh, and you know, from this argument here, you can see that as you approach that limit, that super range begins to shut off. So the uh, growth time sort of uh, goes to zero as you approach that that limit, and then that that's what uh, uh, causes the, the saturation, the instability uh, in, in the purely gravitational case. And then you just have this cloud that's uh, sort of, uh, you know, something synchronized with the black hole uh, and, and just oscillating. And then that oscillation will then produce uh, gravitational waves, uh, which will cause uh, the cloud to uh, dissipate due to gravitational radiation over a longer time scale. Awesome, thanks. Um, we have uh, a question from an anonymous attendee, um, which is, is there a, a close similarity between the vortices in the boson clouds and the quantum vortices in a standard rotating superfluid on Earth? Uh, what are the differences in their properties in this relativistic context? Uh, yeah, I think that that's a great question. Yeah, and actually, uh, I think there's a there's a, a very strong analogy that can be, uh, you know, made between these these vortices and the, the Higgs abelian model uh, and those found in the uh, in type two uh, superconductors. Uh, and so, uh, actually, in some of the work we did trying to uh, understand the the sort of dynamics of these uh, dark photon uh, vortices, uh, that, that that analogy was uh, particularly helpful. Uh, but yeah, I, I think. And so, and in particular, for like the, the dark matter, uh, dark photon, dark matter case, uh, I think that that analogy is uh, particularly relevant for sort of the, you know, the the threshold when you expect these these things to be formed, and then uh, somewhat helpful even in trying to figure out what their uh, subsequent uh, dynamics will be once we have a lot of these work disease and they start uh, interacting. So yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Fantastic. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A and we're basically on time. So I think we can call it there and say thanks very much, William, for a fantastic and really fascinating talk. Um, we are now having a 10 minute break before we start off on the contributed talks, which we'll have three of, um, followed by John Ellis's um, hour long talk after that. But for now, Everyone can have a, a quick break and we'll be back and start sharply on the hour. So see you soon. Thanks again, William. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, I'm very excited to hear what is coming up next in this focus session on particle physics and atom interferometry. Uh, next up, we have Shayan Tanibera, um, take it away. Thanks, Samara, and hello, everyone. I'm Shantani. Uh, I am working at UIB in Spain uh, as a postdoctoral fellow. So my talk today will be on our recent investigations on whether we can detect dark matter that is present in the galactic halo through gravitation and wave propagation um, in such a medium. Specifically, we study the change in the speed of gravitational wave when it propagates through a dark matter that is in a condensed state. So this work has been done in collaboration with Shreya Banerjee and David Mota. So let's dive in. Um, 
I will begin with a little bit of introduction on the origin story of dark matter. So I, I am sure you already know all of this, but just for the completion. Um, in 1933, the, uh, the, the Swiss astrophysicist Fritz Zwicky was investigating the coma cluster and he was trying to estimate the mass of the coma cluster when he found that there was a huge discrepancy between the mass estimate coming from the virial, um, coming from the virial um, uh, theorem and that by you know, adding up the masses of individual galaxies that uh, was that were visible within that cluster. Um, so that was already an indication that there is something missing in the equation. Um, next, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, Vera Rubin and her collaborator were studying the rotational velocities of stars near the edge of the galaxies. And to their surprise, they found that the rotational speed of these stars, they do not fall off as a function of R, um, uh, as we would expect in Newtonian um, uh, mechanics. Rather, it, it kind of saturates to a nearly constant value, as you can see in this figure. Um, later on in 1980s, we had evidences from strong and weak lensing, which required us to incorporate a new kind of matter, which interacts only through, through gravity. And uh, now we know that the dark matter constitutes almost 25% of the observable universe. So moving on, we now have a model of cosmology known as the Lambda CDM model that incorporates both dark matter and dark energy within its theoretical framework. And it's a model that describes an expanding homogeneous and isotropic universe with uh, 12 parameters. It precisely explain the observational data that comes from the cosmic microwave background, the large-scale structure matter power spectrum, the baryon caustic oscillations, et cetera. But uh, it does not come without caveats, okay? So there are multiple discrepancies uh, at galactic and subgalactic scales. Here I list out a few, but this list is not exhaustive. The most important of all of them is the core cusp problem, namely uh, that in the standard CDM picture, we would expect that the density of the um, dark matter halo would uh, increase as a as we go uh, towards the center of the galactic halo and it would form a cusp. But from observations, we now know that the dark matter halo profile is pretty flat near the center. And the other two, the missing satellite problem and the too big to fail problem are kind of interrelated, which says that if we simulate, try to simulate large scale structures using the CDM, um, we end up predicting much more number of sub substructures and uh, satellite galaxies, but we don't see them in observations, right? So um, in order to circumvent these issues, various alternative pathways have been proposed. Um, I'm not going into the um, uh, side of modifying gravity, but I will focus on is uh, modifying the matter sector as the dark matter models, wherein the dark matter can behave uh, as, you know, the, the dark matter can be primordial black holes, they can be neutrinos and warm dark matter, also they can form condensates. So in our work, we focus on the dark matter condensates in particular. So um, broadly speaking, um, if the de Broglie wavelength of a particle is much greater than the mean interparticle distance, then uh, such a system can be described uh, by a macroscopic quantum state in terms of phonon modes. That is to say that uh, all, all, all such particles will share um, an, a common energy state. And unlike uh, cold dark matter, these condensed dark matter are sometimes self-interacting as we uh, find in the case of Bose-Einstein condensed dark matter and superfluid dark matter. But sometimes they can behave as condensed, but then non they can be non-self-interacting as well as in the fuzzy dark matter model. So um, in our analysis, we study these three different dark matter models in the context of gravitational wave propagation, okay? So now the question that we ask is, what happens when a gravitational wave uh, passes through such a medium and how does this medium interact with the gravitational wave? So this kind of study was first done in this paper 
where uh, the idea is basically uh, take, for example, a single particle. And when the gravitational wave encounters such a particle, it gets scattered off the particle. And the phase of the outgoing wave will now be modulated because of this scattering process. So now this scenario can be generalized to a many particle system, uh, but then that's not very trivial exercise, right? And, but but if we work, work in the weak field regime in the linearized gravity, things become much simpler. And uh, one can work out the wave equation um, for the gravitational wave propagating through a medium with a Newtonian potential phi. So the right-hand side of this equation signifies the interaction between the gravitational wave and the uh, material medium through which it is traversing. And due to this phase modulation, the gravitational wave now uh, experiences a modulated um, refractive index um, of the medium, uh, which is given by this expression. The modulation, as we can see, is proportional to the density of the medium, and it's also inversely proportional to the frequency of the incident gravitational wave, okay? And uh, now this equation can also be generalized to a medium that has a varying density profile. Uh, this has been worked out uh, in detail in our paper. If you were interested, you can have a look there. Um, and due to such a modulation of this refractive index, the gravitational wave speed would change um, as uh, compared to the vacuum, you know. And so now if we imagine that we have a source at a distance d and the gravitational wave emitted from that source is traveling to us and while doing so, it has to traverse through a dark matter medium in between with a, of a length r, then it's a relative change in speed with respect to the speed of light will be given by this equation. Again, I'm not going into the detail of the derivation. Um, you can find it in this paper as well. Now, interestingly, this kind of deviation from the speed of light can be detected using the gravitational wave um, and, and multi-messenger astronomy. And in fact, uh, after having discovered almost 90 gravitational wave events in the LIGO-Virgo network, we have only one coincident event that has been detected both in the gravitational wave and the electromagnetic band. And from the delay between the time of arrival of these two signals, one can constrain the speed of gravity um, um, with a precision of 10 to the bar minus 15, as has been reported in this paper. So now, uh, coming back to constraining uh, the dark matter condensate in the uh, galactic halo, we have to first um, find a halo model. So in the standard CDM picture, the dark matter profile follows an NFW profile as given here. But in our case, we consider a generic halo model, which consists of a condensate core surrounded by a crust, where in the crust you have the normal CDM um, non-interacting um, particles. Uh, so the overall uh, density profile would be given by this equation, where this part is the density of the crust, and this part is the density of the core. And theta is a stiff function. Uh, RT here is the transition radius, which signifies a trans smooth transition of the density profile from a condensed behavior to a normal CDM behavior, but that by no means uh, mean that the core density itself goes to zero at RT. That is not true, okay? So in our study, we considered three different models, as I have already mentioned. The first one is a Bose-Einstein condensed dark matter model. Um, the in, in this case, uh, the Lagrangian is um, described by this. So the BC can be described as a, a scalar field with a phi four like potential, and it has two parameters, the mass and the scattering, scattering length A. Okay, and as I have already mentioned that, that that the BEC can be described by a macroscopic uh, quantum wave function, uh, psi, which follows a coupled gross Pitaevsky boso equation. So start, starting from this Lagrangian and using hydrodynamic, uh, hydrostatic equilibrium um, for a spherically symmetric BEC core, one can work out the density profile of, uh, of such a BEC condensate. And uh, the solution is uh, of this form, where RC is the uh, radius of the dark matter, the, the condensate dark matter core, which depends on the model parameters. And so now once we know this density profile, we can work out what 
the modulation to the refractive index will be, and consequently, the effective change in the speed of the gravitational wave can be computed from there. So in this slide, um, I'm showing the results for the BC dark matter. So in the right-hand side uh, plot, you can see the effective change delta C effective as a function of frequency. Um, so interestingly, as you can see, for uh, frequencies of the order of hundreds of hertz, uh, that is uh, the sensitive band for, for LIGO, we have the change in speed, which is much less than the currently reported constant of 10 to the power minus 15. Uh, for LISA, things improve a bit, but still it's much below the current threshold. And as we go towards much, much lower frequency uh, gravitational waves, then things start to improve. And uh, near the nanohertz frequency, it, it barely surpasses the threshold. So using this uh, best case scenario, we can now put bound on the model parameters, M and the scattering length A. So here, the red dashed curve, as you can see, is uh, the constraint coming from delta C effective taking to be 10 to the power minus 15, as, as uh, found by the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. So everything below this, line, uh, the, the red dashed line are allowed parameter space from the gravitational wave speed constraint alone, okay? And the blue line here corresponds to the line uh, um, where the radius of the dark matter core would be equal to the radius of the galaxy. That is to say that uh, the core, uh, the radius of the core cannot be, be greater than the galaxy radius itself. So, Taking that into account, everything above this blue line will be um, allowed by the radius constraint alone. And if we take both of both of these constraints into account, then only this narrow strip in between these two lines are the allowed parameter um, range that uh, can be explored within this model. Three so. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the next model we consider is the superfluid dark matter. Here again, the Lagrangian is given by uh, this. And uh, this model also has two parameters plus one extra parameter, which signifies the phonon-baryon coupling strength. But this does not come into, uh, this, this does not contribute to the um, speed, con uh, the, the speed measurement of the gravitational wave. So we are not concerned about this particular parameter. But once again, uh, by solving the lane Mden equation, we can numerically find the density profile for a superfluid dark matter and uh, can constrain the model parameter lambda and m. Uh, here I show the results for the superfluid dark matter. And once again, in this plot, you can see the, um, the effective um, change in the speed of gravitational wave is very much similar to the VC dark matter as we expect it to be. Um, and uh, the model parameter uh, has been constrained um, um, by taking into account both the radius bound and the gravitational wave speed measurement. And this blue strip uh, in between these two lines is a um, allowed parameter space. The last model is the fuzzy dark matter model. Here, the wave function is described by the schrodinger poiseuille equation, which does not have an interaction term. And the density profile for the fuzzy dark matter core has been taken from this paper. And using this density profile, we can compute what kind of modulation um, we get in terms of the propagation speed of the gravitational wave. This model has only one parameter, the mass parameter. Um, and uh, uh, what we find is that in case of fuzzy dark matter, the uh, constraints are much stronger. In fact, uh, for nanohertz frequency, we already see that the change in effective speed is now um, has surpassed the current threshold. And if we are able to detect um, gravitational wave in nanohertz frequency, um, then in fact, we can uh, explore the parameter space and in fact, might be able to rule out or validate this particular model. Uh, on the right-hand side plot, I kind of sh show a similar thing where um, just to um, reiterate again that the fuzzy dark matter model has much stronger effect uh, compared to the BC or the superfluid dark matter at any given frequency. Um, so to summarize in the here in the 
this table, you can see the prospects of um, validating these different three different kind of dark matter condensates at different frequency bands. These values are the change in uh, the gravitational wave speed. For the case of BC and superfluid dark matter condensate, these uh, values are much below the current threshold, even in the PTA band. But for the fuzzy dark matter, as I have already stated, the PTA band uh, um, will give us a change in gravitational wave speed um, of the order of 10 to the power minus 12, which is already um, some orders of magnitude higher than the current threshold. So uh, the main takeaway um, of uh, the end of the talk would be that pulsar timing arrays, if they are able to detect individual sources that are well localized, they will have the potential to rule out at least one of the dark matter condensate models, which currently is the fuzzy dark matter model. But uh, in the meantime, if also we uh, manage to um, you know, uh, measure the change in the speed much more precisely and uh, lower it down to a level of 10 to the power minus 17, minus 18, then we can very well be able to explore the parameter space of the superfluid and the BC dark matter condensate models as well. With that, I would like to end my talk here and I'll open up with, for questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Really interesting stuff. Um, as before, if anyone would like to um, put their hand up and I'll unmute you or type your question in the Q&A box, we can take off some time for questions. Um, okay, you have a question? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, so like, uh, unlike the LIGO band, like where we see uh, transient event, like two black holes merge or two neutrons merge, yes, we see an event. In this case, we see the gravitational wave and also a flash of light. But in PTA band, even if we see in an individual source of black hole binary, how do you like see the difference in arrival time? Because it will be a continuous wave. It's not a transient event, like it suddenly comes and goes away. Yeah, so right now that is not clear. Like, it, uh, I mean, uh... I'm saying that there is a possibility if we can detect in future uh, 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 you know, a, a signal from a merging supermassive black hole or something like that in the nano uh, uh, you know, nanohertz frequency range. And, and also simultaneously we'll have to detect something in the um, electromagnetic band as well. Then only we, we will be able to um, constrain uh, these dark matter models, but otherwise it seems difficult. But this is just to show that uh, how these uh, effects change with uh, the incident uh, wave frequency, and there is a possibility, um, maybe in future. Okay, thanks. Um, so does that mean the the biggest prospect for reducing the um, the limits here is actually just to measure uh, black you know, stellar mass black holes further away, so we can get that from ten to the minus fifteen sort of time delay limit. To 10 to the minus 17 or something? Uh, so if it's much farther away, we don't know how, I mean, we have not investigated how uh, in detail, how uh, the effect changes with the distance of the source. The investigation has been done taking um, a very close by event like so in principle, it does not depend on the absolute distance and depends on the ratio of how, what fraction of the distance it has to traverse through our dark matter medium. So even if your source is at a much larger distance, it will be covering uh, also a larger distance through uh, the, the intermediate dark matter medium, right? So it does not depend really on the distance, but the ratio between the distance um, in uh, the, the vacuum and uh, the total distance and the distance that ha it has to traverse through this, uh, the kind of dark matter condensates. Um, and yes, um, if we are able to detect a low frequency source somehow, then it would improve uh, the um, measurability of the signal. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions. So uh, let's uh, thank Shayanti again, and we'll um, move on to our next talk. Thank you very much. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Dana Jones. Dana, would you like to share your screen, please? Um, 
And we're going to be hearing about searching for ultralight boson clouds using gravitational waves, I believe. Yes. <laughs> Take it away. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so um, I'm a second year PhD student at Australian National University. And today I'm going to give an overview of the paper I recently submitted to PRD along with the um, listed co-authors here, um, including of course, Will East who kicked off the session um, and it's entitled Methods and Prospects for Gravitational Wave Searches Targeting Ultralight Vector Boson Clouds Around Known Black Holes. Um, and the archive number is listed on the bottom right if anyone's interested in looking at the full paper. Um, and before I start, I just want to thank the coordinators for having me and all of you for listening. Okay, so um, ultralight boson particles, um, which are predicted under multiple different theoretical frameworks, have become increasingly popular dark matter candidates in recent years. Um, and many theories point us to scalar and vector particles, as well as massive tensor fields. Um, but um, I will focus on vector bosons today. Now, unfortunately, these particles are very difficult to detect in terrestrial lab experiments due to their extremely small mass and little to no coupling with standard model particles. Um, but the recent detection of gravitational waves has opened up new doors in terms of studying astrophysical sources. Um, so we will now turn our gaze to astrophysical black holes. Um, so ultralight bosons um, can form clouds around rotating black holes and emit gravitational waves. Um, so how does this process work? Um, quantum fluctuations can cause particle pairs to spontaneously appear near the black hole's horizon after its birth. And most of these particles will simply fall into the black hole, but under the right conditions, a process called superradiance occurs in which the boson field scatters off the black hole with a boost in amplitude. Um, so let's talk about superradiance in just a bit more detail. Um, so most broadly, superradiance is an amplified scattering of waves, and it's a purely kinematic effect that is well understood and appears in a variety of systems. Now, in the case of a spinning black hole in a boson field, amplification results from an exchange in angular momentum. So in other words, we would have an increase in the number of boson particles in the cloud and a corresponding decrease in the black hole spin. However, for superradiance to occur in such systems, the angular frequency of the boson field with respect to the black hole's rotational axis must be less than the angular velocity of the black hole's horizon. So a simpler way to think about this is that when the black hole's horizon has a greater angular velocity, there is still some energy for the boson field to extract. Um, now, this superradiance phenomenon only becomes significant if another condition called the confinement condition is satisfied. And this is where the Compton wavelength of the boson particle, which is determined by its mass, is comparable to the size of the black hole. Now, in this case, the gravitationally bound field naturally serves as a mirror, forming a cavity so that the boson field essentially resonates with the black hole. Um, and this phenomenon is known as superradiant instability, and um, it leads to the exponential growth of the boson cloud as the field extracts energy and angular momentum from the black hole. Um, and I've included this um, simplified graphic to help you better visualize black hole superradiance. Um, so the bosonic waves will scatter off the black hole with a boost in amplitude, and then scatter off of this quote unquote mirror, and then repeat this process with exponential growth in amplitude. Um, now, of course, there's not an actual mirror here, but um, rather it's the field itself forming a resonance cavity around the black hole. So the cloud will continue to grow until the black hole has been spun down so much that the superradiance condition is no longer satisfied and the field cannot be any further amplified. Um, and at this point, the cloud begins to dissipate as the boson particles annihilate into gravitons radiating outward in the form of quasi-monochromatic long duration gravitational waves. Um, and if you wanna think about it from a classical perspective, our gravitational wave emission stems from a rotating dumbbell shaped cloud, which is corresponding to the fastest growing energy level um, for these vector bosons. Um, and so while a gravitational wave detection would certainly be exciting, um, no detection is still interesting um, because we can use it to place constraints on boson properties. 
So when the vector boson mass satisfies both the superradiance and confinement conditions for a particular black hole, the superradiant instability phenomenon is maximized. Um, so this means that for a black hole with a given mass and spin, significant cloud growth will only occur for a range of boson masses. Um, and as it turns out, astrophysical black holes could be used to probe masses ranging from 10 to the negative 20 to 10 to the negative 10 electron volts. Um, whereas ground-based detectors are sensitive to frequencies corresponding to a mass range of 10 to the negative 14 to 10 to the negative 11 electron volts, um, which is lucky for us given that this range falls within the allowed range for black holes. Um, so you can see um, this in the first panel here where we've plotted the optimally matched boson mass for black holes ranging from five to a thousand solar masses. And we define this, we define this optimal boson mass as the mass that yields the largest signal at cloud saturation. Now, the different colored lines refer to different black hole spins. So you can see that, for example, if we are targeting a black hole with large mass and low spin, the optimally matched boson will be in a lower mass range. So now in the middle and bottom panels, we are showing the um, peak strain amplitude and the frequency of emission at the peak strain for the same range of black hole masses. And so these strain amplitudes and frequencies correspond to systems where we've used the optimally matched boson masses. And because both of these values evolve quite rapidly in time, we are showing only what their values are at cloud saturation. Now, unsurprisingly, um, lower spins lead to lower frequencies and smaller strain amplitudes. Um, and as the black hole mass increases, the frequency shifts into the lower band while the strain amplitude increases. Now the boson frequency, which is determined by the particle's energy, determines the frequency of gravitational wave emission. Um, so these systems will emit at a range of frequencies um, from tens to hundreds of hertz, depending on the system parameters. Um, so this is demonstrated in the plot on the left here, where you can see the signal strength as a function of um, emission frequency for different black hole masses. Um, and so the color corresponds to alpha, which is the, the so-called fine structure constant. And so this is a term that quantifies how optimally matched the boson mass is to the black hole mass in terms of maximizing cloud growth. So each curve shown here is a different black hole, and each point on the curve is a different boson mass, where the boson mass is at and around the peak of the curve will produce louder gravitational wave signals, um, each one with a slightly different emission frequency. As you can see, um, each curve very suddenly drops off for alpha values larger than about 0.2. And this is simply because superradiance is no longer satisfied for these systems at, at such high alphas. Um, and so I think what this plot nicely demonstrates is that in order to increase our chances of making a detection, we will want to probe a slightly wider parameter space in our search, taking into account the optimally matched boson mass as well as slightly less optimal masses, which in some cases still produce potentially detectable signals. Now, the image on the right is showing the frequency derivative or the spin up of the signal as a function of black hole mass and spin. Um, and I will expand on this more in a future slide, but using our current search methods, we're only able to probe f dot values up to roughly um, one by 10 to the negative four hertz per second. Um, but fortunately, this does cover the majority of our parameter space. Now, here we're showing the um, cloud growth timescale in the top panel and the gravitational wave emission timescale in the bottom panel for a range of different initial black hole masses and alpha values. And this is for a fixed spin of 0.7. Now, the important thing to note here is that the growth timescale is orders of magnitude shorter than the emission timescale. Um, and this allows us to treat these as essentially like two distinct eras. Um, so in a real search, we would ideally wait until the vector boson cloud has had sufficient time to grow, allowing the strain amplitude to approach its maximum before we start searching for a signal. Luckily, in most cases, the cloud um, is going to reach its full size within anything from a few minutes to a few days. So um, we wouldn't actually have to wait that long. Um, 
So Will already gave you an introduction to scalar and vector bosons, so I'll kind of skip over that and just mention that scalar bosons have already been pretty extensively studied, um, and I've included a reference for the um, O3 LVK um, scalar boson all sky search paper here. Um, so as I mentioned before, we focus on vector bosons here, which are more complicated to model, but which produce signals that are actually potentially within the detectable range of current generation detectors, which makes them well worth the extra effort. Now, the main challenge we face here in terms of generating vector boson signals is that both the signal strain and the frequency evolve quite significantly in time. And so we, we use the numerical relativity modeling tool um, known as SuperRAD that Will described to produce more accurate signal waveforms, and we develop a new framework for injecting these signals. Um, and we use a popular continuous wave search technique based on hidden Markov model tracking, um, and we implement a new pipeline to track signals on timescales from hours to months. Now, while there are many possibilities in terms of choosing an ideal target to run the search on, the most straightforward choice is a remnant black hole from a CBC event detected by the LVK. Um, and these sources are useful for a number of reasons. So for one thing, we have prior knowledge of the black hole's age, mass, and spin, allowing us to better predict the signal evolution and time scale. Um, also, because vector boson signals are relatively short-lived, we prefer to look at young black holes. Um, and also many CPC remnants have at least somewhat decently well-constrained sky positions using the detector network. Um, and certainly running the search over a narrower sky grid is, is going to save us on computation time in the end. Um, so now I want to take a bit of time to discuss our proposed horizon distances. So on the left here is our estimated horizon distances shown as the color for two um, LIGO detectors at design sensitivity in this top panel, um, and then for future generation detectors in the bottom two panels. So in other words, what these images are showing is the farthest distance a black hole with a given mass and spin could lie and still produce a gravitational wave signal detectable on Earth. Um, and the gray area is showing the region of the parameter space um, where the signal is evolving too quickly to track using continuous wave methods. Um, and then in the brightest region of the parameter space for black holes with spins of, of about 0.8 and above um, that are a few hundred solar masses, we may be able to detect um, signals on the order of gigaparsecs away with current generation detectors, um, which is a very exciting result. Um, and I also want to note that we take into consideration the non-trivial effect of redshift, which actually results in a sensitivity gain as the luminosity distance is increased. And this is because the red as the redshift effect becomes greater, the frequency derivative of the signal becomes smaller. Um, and for a signal that is evolving more slowly, we are able to extend the coherence time used in the search, um, which yields an increase in sensitivity. Um, and so this is a lucky effect, um, especially given that some systems require coherence lengths on the order of a few minutes. <laughs> so any bit of gain sensitivity will be very useful in these cases. Now, um, it's important to note that these horizon distances represent the farthest distance we can reach for each system for its optimally matched boson mass, which once again is the boson mass which maximizes the intrinsic strain amplitude of the signal. So one might then sort of naively think that each of these horizon distances is the very furthest distance we can reach for that particular system, um, because this is the case for scalar bosons. Um, and certainly that's what I thought initially. Um, but in fact, this isn't true as demonstrated by this figure on the right here, um, which is showing how our choice of boson mass represented by this aforementioned alpha term impacts the horizon distance for a range of black hole masses, um, where the dashed white line marks the alpha value corresponding to the optimally matched boson mass. Um, so as you can see, okay, thank you. As you can see, um, the optimally matched boson does not produce the best horizon distance in any system. Um, and in fact, there's actually quite a wide range of boson masses for a particular black hole um, that yields better horizon distances. Um, and this is because for less optimally matched bosons, although the intrinsic strain amplitude of the signal is less, the signal evolves much more slowly and occurs over a significantly longer time scale. Um, and so again, this allows us to extend both our coherence time and our total observing time in the search. 
And as it turns out, the sensitivity we gain from being able to increase the coherence in observing times actually outweighs the sensitivity loss due to smaller intrinsic signal power. Um, so this yields an overall net gain in sensitivity, particularly for very short signals. Um, so this important fact actually makes vector boson searches more promising than we had previously anticipated. So with these findings in mind, we are keeping an eye on the latest detections with um, plans to run a vector boson search as soon as a, a promising detection is made. So um, as I mentioned previously, one of the reasons we choose to target CBC merger remnants is because they are generally well localized by the detector network. Um, but this begs the question, just how good does the sky localization need to be to make one of these searches computationally feasible. So to investigate this, we've um, injected two different signals into Gaussian noise, um, one that occurs over um, a short time scale um, and on the order of hours, and then one that occurs over a much longer one on the order of months. So each image displayed here is showing the detection significance of the recovered signal as a function of the sky position targeted by the search. Um, where in the center of the plot, we've targeted the true sky position at which we inject the signal, um, while for every other point on the plot, we've targeted a position that's slightly offset from the true position. And now the color is the ratio of the detection significance of the recovered signal to the detection threshold. So um, at every position where the color value is greater than one, the signal has been successfully recovered by the search. So while on the right, you can see um, an elliptical region in the sky that's spanning roughly 400 square degrees where the signal's recovered, on the left, it's recovered for the entire patch of sky, which is pretty amazing. Um, and what this means is that generally we should even be able to run searches on candidates with relatively poor sky localization because assuming an incorrect sky position will not have a great impact on our ability to detect the signal. Um, especially for short dura duration signals, um, which incidentally is what we would expect to see from um, remnant black holes with spins of roughly 0.7. Um, okay, so just to summarize what I've talked about today, um, through a process called superating instability, ultralight boson clouds can grow exponentially around black holes and emit long duration gravitational waves. Um, so we develop a new pipeline to search for gravitational wave signals from vector bosons using a hidden Markov model-based tracking scheme um, for timescales from hours to months. And in fact, this method could be applied to other types of signals occurring over similar timescales, um, such as, for instance, those in pulsar post-glitch searches. Um, and in some optimal scenarios, we may be able to reach signals at a luminosity distance above about a gigaparsec. Um, and our next steps will be to run the search on a handful of promising black hole CBC remnants detected during um, the LBK's fourth observing run. And if we're unable to detect anything, we will be able to hopefully constrain the existence of ultralight boson particles within certain mass ranges. Um, so yeah, thank you all for listening and I can take questions. Thanks very much, Dana. Um, and does anyone have a quick question? Um, hand up or tap in the Q, type in the Q and A. I have a really quick one. You were talking about which follow up, uh, like figuring out which ones to follow up and and that kind of thing. What exactly does follow up look like? How do you follow these up? Right. Um, so you know, it would be a combination of obviously running simulations as well as as um, you know running a real search. So um, like the first thing that I typically do when when new detections come in is um, so, um, you know, using this horizon distance plot here, I can, um, you know, input the, the mass and the spin, um, from the parameter estimation and, you know, figure out if, if the, you know, rough distance this event was detected at is like within a promising range, um, given, given the estimated horizon distances <clears throat> and, um, you know, if, if that's the case, um, then, you know, we would want to um, follow up further on this event. Um, and so we would, uh, you know, this is kind of still a bit of a work in progress, but, you know, it's it's quite a large parameter space. So we, we're kind of, you know, figuring out like um, which parameters we can kind of fix and which parameters we would have to search over, um, you know, to be confident that we would detect a signal if it does exist. And this would also mean, you know, searching over quite a 
you know, larger band of, of boson masses um, and frequencies and whatnot. So we would have to kind of like tile together um, different, um, you know, search configurations um, over the parameter space to, to try to, you know, maximize the chance that we would make a detection. Um, cool. Yeah, did, did that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I was just yeah, I was wondering if you were cool. like doing any extra observations or following up on this stuff. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks heaps. I don't see any other uh questions and we've um hit our 20 minute marks. So uh with very much thanks to Dana. Uh we'll move Thank on to so the next uh, uh, So uh, the next speaker is Yuta Michimura, um, who's going to tell us all about ultralight dark matter searches with laser interferometry so go ahead so i'm going to talk about ultralight dark matter searches with laser interferometers um as dana already said um we are also um searching for ultralight dark matter which is the lightest <clears throat> end of dark matter um candidates and this is because ultralight dark matter behaves as waves rather than particles <clears throat> if you calculate the frequency of the waves for 10 to the minus 12 electron volt dark matter, it's at like around like 200 hertz, which is at the most sensitive uh, frequency region for um, laser interferometers in, on ground like LIGO. So <clears throat> um, similar to gravitational waves, if there are some waves from dark matter, um, laser interferometers are sensitive. The difference between Dana's talk and our, my talk is that um, we search for a direct interaction of ultralight dark matter to laser interferometers. And then the, um, this is actually sensitive to different kinds of dark matter. Um, the one thing, well, one is, for example, um, tiny forces from vector dark matter. So if our universe is filled with vector dark matter, um, it will give some tiny forces to mirrors. And um, it, if the mirror moves, we can detect it as an interference um, pattern change. And this um, search has been already done in LIGO and Virgo collaboration using actual data, which is presented in this paper. And also if there's scalar dark matter, mirror thickness changes, and this can be searched, also searched with laser interferometry. And this search is actually um, done by Geo 600 in Germany. And also, even if the length doesn't change, if the phase velocity of light changes from axions, we can also search for this because the phase velocity change is equivalent to length change. And this is um, has not been done, but um, proposed in this paper. And also recently, in my colleague um, um, proposed another dark matter um, model, which is a spin two dark matter. So it's a tensor dark matter which couples to metric just as gravitational waves. So we can also search for this kind of um, spin to dark matter. And for this spin to dark matter, um, there's a poster by um, Yusuke Manita. So maybe um, you can also look at the poster. And also for the axions, um, there's a poster number 170 by Takidera-kun. So maybe also you can um, check these posters. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on axion like dark matter and also um, vector bosons uh, using a tabletop experiment called DANCE and also um, laser interferometers like LIGO, Virgo, and Kaga. So I will first um, focus on axion like particles. So axions and axion like particles um, um, are predicted by um, various kinds of string theory or supergravity and many experiments. Are, have been done um, to search for axions using axion photon coupling. And especially using magnetic fields, um, photon is converted into axions or axion is converted into photons under magnetic field, which is called the Primakov effect. So people can search for axions using magnetic fields. But, I, but our idea is different. Um, uh, we are gonna use polarization modulation of light from axions. So because axion and photon coupling is um, uh, creates different phase velocity between left-handed and right-handed um, polarizations because parity is violated in the axions. 
So um, if you um, write up the equations, you get left-handed and right-handed phase velocity of light to be modulated at axial mass with an amplitude uh, which is proportional to um, axial photon coupling constant. Mm -hmm. So this is in circular polarization basis, but if you convert this into linear polarization basis, um, linear polarization plane is actually modulated in this kind of manner. So even if you um, inject S polarization, which is, for example, vertical polarization, um, this um, polarization plane is modulated like this. So um, there's some slight horizontal polarization created at sidebands. And this sideband frequency corresponds to axial mass and the amplitude of the sidebands correspond to the coupling constant. So if you search for um, modulated polarization um, at different frequencies, um, you can search for axions with different masses. And this can be, so this can be done without magnetic field. So basically, the idea is to um, put some linearly polarized light. And then um, as light propagates, polarization plane rotates. So if you detect some depolarization of light, um, you can detect axions. But um, it's very sh the effect is very small. So if the distance is short, the, it's very hard to detect. So what we usually do to effectively increase the optical path length is to create a cavity like this. But if you use a linear cavity, um, upon reflection on the mirror, um, polarization is flipped. So if you get the polarized beam to be, for example, tilted in right to the right, um, um, upon mirror reflection, it goes to the left. So in the end, you will uh, average out the polarization rotation. So our idea was to use a voltaic cavity, which has two reflections at both ends. So because of two reflections, um, the polarization state is conserved inside the cavity. So you can um, effectively increase um, the signal. So we proposed this dark matter axon search with ring cavity experiment dubbed DANCE um, to search for a modulated um, polarization rotation and which is enhanced by this voltage cavity. So you basically inject some linear polarization, for example, S polarization, and inside the cavity, P polarization, the orthogonal polarization is generated from axions. So from the transmission, you look for P polarization to look for axion signal. So if there's no axion signal, there's no P polarization. And if there's some P polarization, that means you detect the axion. So it's a new experiment. And if you do the calculation, um, with this kind of parameters, um, you can search for um, axion photon coupling in this region. And this y axis, uh, sorry, x axis is, is axion mass, and um, y axis is axion photon coupling. And then this uh, shaded region is uh, already constrained region. But if you use this experiment, you can um, search for um, known, um, uh, non constrained region. And even if you use some moderate parameters, um, you can also beat cast limit. So we call this dance act one experiment. And we are now um, um, performing this kind of um, experiment at the University of Tokyo. And um, this is the setup. And then um, this is a photo of the setup. And then we actually performed the, our first observing run in 2021. Um, for uh, 12 days and use 24 hour data to put an upper limit. So this is our upper um, current upper limit we obtained from 12 day run. Actually, the limit is not as good as cast by like, say, like maybe like six orders of magnitude um, because um, this setup was um, um, just a, um, a proof, proof of principle experiment. But anyway, we demonstrated the principle and also we uh, demonstrated the data analysis methods, which is presented in this archive paper. And now we are um, trying to upgrade the sensitivity of this dance experiment. And this um, um, details are uh, presented in this poster. So please have a look. And then 
um, I'm going to move on to axion detection with um, LIGO or Virgo or Kagra. So as I said, linear cavities are not sensitive to axions um, at low, low frequency axions. This is because, as I said, um, if, we, if axion mass is very small, even if the light propagates back and forth between linear cavities, polarization is flipped. And then during this propagation, axion do not oscillate. So if, um, if axion is, for example, axion, poten axion is in this um, kind of potential, um, the axion, os axion almost doesn't oscillate. So polarization plane is always rotated to the light, for example. So you don't get any enhancement from the cavity. But if the axion mass is high and axion frequency or axion period is comparable to um, um, speed uh, comparable to um, uh, round trip speed, uh, round trip time of um, light propagating within the cavity. So for example, if the polarization plane um, tilts to the right and then flipped, and then at the same time, at the same period, if the axion oscillation also flips, it also uh, flips the polarization plane. So actually the, ax, um, the polarization rotation is enhanced. So at the specific frequency, for example, for um, LIGO, this um, red curve, um, at specific axion mass, the sensitivity is enhanced because of this effect. And, but at the low frequency, the sensitivity will be worse um, because at the low frequency, the effect is canceled out. Three minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, and then and then to do this search, we just need to install polarizers to the output port of gravitational wave detectors, and then we actually installed um, polarization optics for Kagra, and data is take, uh, will be taken during O4. And for LIGO, um, there's actually a polarizer installed for a different purpose. So maybe we can also do um, action search with LIGO using um, polarizer data. And then I'm gonna uh, move on to gauge boson search using LIGO and Virgo and Kagra. So as I said, if there's gauge boson or vector dark matter, um, it, will it will couple to some dark charges in the mirror, and then it will create some oscillating force. For example, the charge we are considering is barium minus lepton number. So it's B minus, it's called B minus L, and it's conserved in the standard model. So it can be gauged. So it can be some new forces. And this is B minus L, so it's roughly um, neutron, neutron number. So it couples to a neutron number, and then neutron number is different between different materials. So if you look for um, forces, acting on mirror, which has different um, material, or you can search for this kind of um, dark matter models. And then, as I said, it will create some oscillating force to mirrors. So for example, if this is a cavity, this creates oscillating force like this. So if um, two mirrors are the same, they move in the same way. So basically the length doesn't change. So there's almost no effect in um, symmetric cavity, like um, something used in LIGO or Virgo. Um, but there, since there's some phase difference between two mirrors, and also there's finite light traveling time, um, there's some residual effect. So actually LIGO and Virgo um, searched for this kind of signal and put um, the best limit um, um, from um, LIGO and Virgo O3 data. But since um, they are losing some signal because most of the, um, uh, all of the mirrors are made of pure silica and there's no um, force difference rather than, uh, other than the phase difference between mirrors. So, but in Kagura, we use sapphire mirrors and pure silica mirrors. So the force acting on pure silica mirror and sapphire mirror is different. So for example, um, the pure silica has less neutral number than sapphire. So sapphire moves more than pure silica. So if you measure the distance between pure silica and sapphire, you can actually um, directly measure this P minus L vector dark matter. 
Um, and if you do the calculation, um, if you use Liger or Virgo, uh, maybe you are sensitive to this region, but if you use um, the distance between field silica and sapphire, um, you are sensitive at low frequency region because of this um, um, different charge between sapphire and field silica. And then we are um, actually doing the data analysis using our um, Kagura data from um, April 2022. And uh, actually the sensitivity was not as good as we um, anticipated. It is um, roughly six orders of magnitude um, lower than our design sensitivity. But anyway, we are using the same pipeline developed for dance experiment. Um, the axiom experiment I explained in the beginning to search for a vector dark matter signal and the result will be available soon after um, internal review. So in summary, we are doing axion dark matter search and vector dark matter search using both tabletop experiment called DANCE and also um, large scale gravitational wave detector like LIGO and Virgo and Kaga. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, also very interesting stuff. Um, are there any questions? Remember, type your questions in the Q&A or just raise your hand and I'll uh, unmute you. So if there's no questions from the floor, I might ask a quick one. Um, of the dark matter types that you're, you're searching for, which ones have the most interesting constraints with current data um, sort of that are relevant for cosmology? Yeah, so I think the, um, I think it's from, from cosmology. Um, this mass region is maybe too heavy, mm -hmm. but um, um, the most stringent constraint is actually um, um, done from uh, done from LIGO and Virgo O3 data for vector dark matter. So I think it, it's this is the most um, like meaningful um, constraint so far. And also, I didn't mention, but um, um, Geo 600 in Germany placed the uh, a most stringent limit for scalar dark matter. I, I didn't present, but this paper presents the result and this is also interesting. Very interesting. I really liked this slide that you had here with the different uh, <laughs> Thank you. ways that things could affect stuff. Um, are there any other questions? Cool. If not, I suggest we thank all the um, speakers in this session again. Thank you very much for your really fascinating um, talks. Um, we have a couple of minutes before um, John will start his talk. So let's take a, a couple of minutes breather and we'll start again right on the hour. Thanks everybody. Um, okay, so for the final uh, speaker of this focus session, um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome John Ellis, who's going to tell us about uh, different ways of measuring gravitational waves with at atom interferometry. Take it away, John. Okay, thanks very much for the uh, invitation. Thanks for the introduction. And I'll uh, wish you uh, ni hao, because uh, I'm speaking to you from Beijing, where it's uh, somewhat early in the morning. Okay, so uh, atom interferometry is uh, a technique for uh, looking for actually ultralight dark matter as well as gravitational waves, which uh, a number of us are around the world are uh, working on at the moment. So I'm happy to uh, represent this uh, growing community. Uh, if you're interested, uh, I wrote a review together with uh, Oliver Buchmuller and uh, Ulrich Schneider, which appeared uh, recently on the archive. And uh, you'll find some of my material uh, in that talk, in that paper. Okay, so uh, let me start off by uh, setting the scene from uh, from my particular point of view. So this is the uh, familiar picture of the uh, stellar graveyard of uh, merging black holes and, and neutron stars. And uh, as you all know, uh, LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra have observed mergers of uh, black holes weighing up to about 80 times that of the sun. Uh, astrophysicists expect there to be a gap around 100 times the mass of the sun. And it's an open question uh, whether that gap exists and what lies beyond it, whether there are uh, heavier masses. And that, that's one of the topics that we'll be exploring later on. 
course, uh, coming along, uh, there is uh, Lisa and uh, also at least one Chinese project. And uh, they'll be looking for processes involving uh, supermassive black holes. Uh, so we, we know those exist, uh, weighing a million solar masses or more. And uh, the hopes are high that uh, LISA will be able to observe uh, direct mergers. So of course, LISA opened the question, uh, how can we observe objects in intermediate in mass between those galactic center black holes, which are very well known, and the uh, stellar mass black holes, which are being observed by uh, LIGO, Virgo, and Kaiba. So if I look in uh, frequency space, uh, there's this uh, picture, which is also, I think, uh, very familiar to all of you. So uh, over on the right-hand side, we have uh, laser interferometers uh, such as uh, LIGO and ET and CE uh, with a maximum sensitivity somewhere around 100 hertz. Uh, in the middle, we've got uh, LISA and other space-borne laser interferometers with a maximum sensitivity around uh, 10 to the minus 2 hertz or so. And of course, we've got the pulsar timing arrays uh, down in the nanohertz region. So uh, with atom interferometers, we're particularly interested in targeting the gap in between uh, LIGO-Virgo uh, class detectors and uh, LISA class detectors. And uh, in that gap, we might hope to observe processes involving intermediate mass uh, black holes, which might give us some insight into how supermassive black holes uh, were uh, put together. And uh, there's other gravitational wave topics which can also be uh, looked at in that intermediate frequency range. Uh, for example, uh, uh, memories of uh, supernova explosions, phase transitions, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, of course, it can't have escaped you that there's a, another big gap, the one between LISA and the pulsar timing arrays. So I don't have much to say about that, but I will come back to pulsar timing arrays in the latter part of my talk. Uh, as you can imagine, I couldn't resist saying something about them. Okay, so let me start off by uh, talking about the basic principle of atom interferometers. So uh, you can think of them by analogy with uh, a traditional Mach Zender laser interferometer, which of course is the basis for the ongoing uh, experiments LIGO Virgo Kagra. And uh, you just had a very beautiful presentation of that with that uh, lovely slide by the previous speaker. So, uh, in the case of a laser interferometer, you got uh, an input beam, you split it. Uh, the two split beams are then reflected in mirrors and they are recombined, and uh, you look for interference fringes. Uh, the place where you, the two beams uh, meet again. So with an atom interferometer, it's a rather similar principle. You start off with uh, a cloud of atoms, which serves as your input. You uh, hit those atoms with a uh, laser pulse, which is carefully tuned to uh, split the, pulse, the uh, atom cloud into two components. Now, when the laser hits an atom, it excites it. When it excites it, it also gives it momentum. And the excited atoms shown here by the dashed red lines separate from the uh, ground state atoms. Then what you can do is you can apply a second pulse, a so-called mirror laser pulse, which uh, basically changes the ground state into excited state atoms and the excited into ground state. And that has the effect of uh, closing this sort of uh, lozenge shaped loop here so that the uh, two clouds of atoms come back together. You hit them with a uh, final beam splitter pulse and this enables you to uh, get two populations of atoms uh, which you can then interfere. So the interference patterns obviously depend on the fact that uh, the atoms have followed different paths just like the uh, uh, laser beams over here in a laser interferometer, and uh, you gain by having the most uh, dense clouds, by separating those clouds as much as possible, and by having the largest possible propagation distance for the clouds of atoms. So uh, various different uh, atoms are being considered for uh, or used for laser interferometers. Uh, for example, one popular atom is the rubidium, 
the projects which I'm going to be discussing mainly uh, use uh, transition in strontium, which is actually used in atomic clocks. So uh, why are we interested in this? Well, it's because it's a, a relatively long-lived state, and it's one where you can go through this uh, cycle of excitation that I discussed on the previous slide multiple times. And the more times you go through that cycle, the larger the momentum transfer that's imparted, and the more separated the paths come. And also, of course, you can propagate over larger distances. So we think that uh, strontium is a very good candidate for uh, optimal sensitivity of such a laser interferometer. So there's other, one other uh, feature of the uh, atom interferometer designs, which I want to discuss, which is actually, that they're not just interferometers, they're actually gradiometers, in the sense that you would have several of these interferometers arranged in the configuration that I'm going to be mainly focusing on, it's in a uh, vertical vacuum tube. Then each of these interferometers is uh, interrogated by the same laser, indicated on the right here by this uh, red uh, uh, wiggly line. And uh, you know, one of the things that we're going to be working on in the coming years is uh, maximizing the length of this vertical baseline and uh, having as many uh, atom interferometers as possible. Now I talk about gradiometer because then you can make a differential measurement between the effects on this interferometer and that interferometer. And since they're interrogated by the same laser beam, uh, you to a large extent uh, eliminate uh, laser noise. And having multiple interferometers in the same shaft enables you to uh, minimize gravity gradient noise, which I'll return to later on. Okay, so I uh, should declare my personal bias. Uh, I'm actually a member of a collaboration in the UK, which is uh, developing atom interferometers. It's called uh, Aon. And uh, here top left, I've uh, listed our current collaborators. And the ones who are circled are the ones who are in my research group at uh, King's College London. Now, I should say that we are working very closely and actually contributing to a parallel experiment called MAGIS in the US. And uh, the name AON stands for Atom Interferometer Observatory and Network. And uh, we plan to uh, network uh, with the MAGIS experiment uh, when the two detectors are up and running. So uh, this is currently uh, a UK project. It's received uh, initial funding from the UK funding agency to uh, prepare the construction of a, a prototype 10 meter Aeon uh, device. And then we foresee various uh, subsequent stages, which I will discuss at least uh, briefly later on. So uh, the following stage would be a 100 meter device uh, that in due time would be hopefully followed by a device on a vertical scale of about a kilometer. That's pretty much the maximum that you can manage on Earth. Uh, for various reasons. First of all, it's difficult to find a vertical shaft, which is uh, more than one kilometer long. And uh, also there's difficulties with the Earth's rotation that come in if you try to go longer. So the next stage will be to go into space, and that's a project called uh, EDGE, uh, which I'll discuss also later on. Okay, so I talked uh, earlier on about the uh, basic principle of an atom interferometer. Uh, just to be clear, I, I'm, I'm a theorist, so please don't try to uh, interrogate me too much on the experimental details, uh, but I do have a few slides about uh, how this thing is put together. So, uh, as I said, you start off with a cloud of atoms, which you're subsequently going to interrogate in a vertical shaft with a laser system. So, you need an atom source, and uh, this is a, an engineering drawing of uh, the sort of atom source that we've built for Aeon. So it has a sequence of chambers where you prepare the atom cloud. These are finally finish up in uh, the chamber, which then launches, uses a launching pad for the actual interferometer tube. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, initially, 
that interferometer tube will be uh, one meter before we get onto the uh, bigger devices that I discussed previously. So the Aon collaboration has uh, several different atom experimental groups uh, working in the UK. And uh, we've uh, currently equipped each of these experimental groups with uh, laser uh, uh, systems and uh, source devices. And uh, this just uh, shows you uh, the setups in uh, those different university laboratories and also the Rutherford Laboratory, also in the UK. So those uh, laser sources are uh, starting to uh, operate. And uh, this is a, a pair of images from uh, one at uh, Imperial College. So the way things work, you start off with a sort of formless cloud of strontium atoms. And first of all, you uh, confine them in two dimensions, uh, but they're extended in the third dimension. And then the second stage is to get, so squeeze them again in the third dimension and uh, you get a, so basically a beam spot or well, it's called a beam spot, a cloud spot. And uh, that's what's shown here. So this is the two-dimensional chamber, and this is the uh, three-dimensional chamber. And uh, my experimental colleagues are currently uh, working to optimize these. Okay, so, uh, so far we're at the uh, laboratory stage and uh, the first uh, real experimental stage of interest to uh, the audience will be the 10 meter device, which we plan to locate in the basement of the Oxford Physics Department. So uh, this is a relatively recent building with a, uh, an underground facility, which is uh, designed to be as seismically uh, as stable as possible. And it also has at the basement level, a uh, laser laboratory where we can uh, put our laser system. And uh, over here on the right, you see a uh, sort of sketch of uh, where uh, Aon 10 would fit within the building. Uh, we've actually got uh, detailed engineering diagrams for what the apparatus would look like, uh, but I don't have uh, those to hand. So the initial idea would be that we would have uh, two interferometers with a source at the bottom and a source in the middle, which we'd, we would somehow uh, compare with each other in the sort of gradientometer configuration that I mentioned earlier. So as I mentioned, uh, we're working in partnership with the uh, MAGIS 100 experiment at Fermilab. So uh, they're uh, underway with the uh, construction of a 100 meter device in a vertical shaft, uh, which was built to give access to the uh, Fermilab neutrino beam. So here circled with the arrow is uh, where this shaft is located. So it's some distance away from the original uh, neutrino source. Neutrinos are gradually heading uh, underground towards a neutrino detector uh, several hundred kilometers to your right. So uh, here is a close up of the uh, experimental facility itself, which is uh, rather like what we're planning for Aeon. So uh, here's the vertical shaft. Uh, there's a lo laser laboratory at the top, uh, with, uh, which feeds a beam into the vertical shaft. And they're also planning uh, two or three uh, sources at various heights along this vertical shaft. And uh, this little inset here gives you a, a sort of cross-sectional view of uh, what the facility looks like. So you've got uh, the vertical uh, vacuum tube and uh, an access platform so that you can work on the shaft, work on the source. Now, as I mentioned, there are various other uh, atom interferometer projects uh, underway around the world. And uh, this slide here gives you a sort of uh, overview of that. So uh, starting from the top left, we have the VLBAI, very long baseline atom interferometer project, which is under construction in Hanover. So uh, they're uh, also in a building. Uh, they're also about 10 meters of height. Uh, they're not uh, underground like uh, Aeon, uh, but otherwise uh, the basic concept is uh, very similar. 
<coughs> Bottom left, we have MIGA, which is uh, an experiment which is also con under construction in France. Uh, it's actually uh, constructed in a uh, repurposed atomic nuclear weapon bunker. Uh, so uh, the red button has been taken away and it's been replaced by uh, a couple of 150 meter long horizontal uh, tubes. So they're using a somewhat different geometry from the one that I've been talking about, uh, in which they have <coughs> many atom sources located uh, along this horizontal shaft. Uh, they cannot interrogate those sources as often as we're planning to do, uh, but they also hope to achieve comparable sensitivity. Bottom right, I have a, a very interesting facility which is under construction in China called uh, Zaiga, which is uh, inside a mountain near uh, Wuhan. And uh, they are going to have a vertical shaft and uh, quite a complicated set of uh, horizontal galleries. So they'll be able to try uh, both techniques, the vertical and also the horizontal. Uh, so in addition to Aeon, I've also been uh, involved in a study at CERN. I mean, when you think of where you might find a, a 100 meter vertical shaft, which is uh, in good engineering shape, you might think of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. It's on average 100 meters underground. And indeed, there are a number of access shafts going down, including one which is not being used very much, which is actually 140 meters in height. And uh, we did a, an engineering study of that uh, earlier on this year. And I'll just briefly show some, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Something right now the wrong way. <laughs> And this is under study as a possible location for a European vertical 100 meter project. So these are some uh, pictures of uh, components of the uh, MIGA experiment in France under construction. So here's a segment of their vacuum tube uh, atom source, uh, and this is their underground gallery. So as I mentioned, uh, we did this engineering stuff study at CERN. Uh, so we were very uh, grateful for the collaboration of a number of CERN engineers. And uh, this is uh, the possible layout of a 100 meter vertical atom interferometer at CERN. So here's a Large Hadron Collider uh, tunnel where the LHC beam circulates. Uh, this PX46 is the access shaft which uh, we would use is a cross section through the shaft. So uh, it's uh, over 10 meters across. Most of the cross section area is reserved for use by the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, accelerator team for raising and lowering equipment. But there's uh, an area over the side where we could locate a laser interferometer. And uh, here you see a, a cross section showing again uh, the vacuum tube, uh, uh, an atom source, and an access platform for the experimental team that would work on the atom interferometer. Okay, so uh, back to gravitational waves. So this is a, a close-up of the uh, frequency range that uh, we're interested in. So, <laughs> Over on the right hand side, we have the uh, sensitivity of LIGO and the perspective sensitivity of uh, the Einstein telescope, optimized around uh, 10 to 100 hertz. <laughs> Over on the left, we've got uh, LISA, which is uh, optimized around 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3 hertz. And here, circled in red, is the intermediate frequency gap that uh, we're targeting around, let's say, uh, 0.1 to 1 hertz. And uh, coming down here, the vertical axis is the characteristic strain. We show the perspective sensitivities of uh, Aeon 10, which is no, really not in the gravitational wave business. Aeon 100, which starts to get into the gravitational wave business, 
and uh, Aeon Kilometer and the space-based version Edge, which uh, we think would have very interesting sensitivity, not only for gravitational waves, but also as I'll discuss later, uh, ultralight uh, uh, cold dark matter. So as I mentioned, we're interested, uh, for example, in uh, probing uh, the presence of intermediate mass black holes and the formation potentially of supermassive black holes. And here we see, uh, for example, the uh, gravitational wave signal that we would expect from uh, a merger of uh, two 10,000 mass uh, black holes. So here we see the N4 region, here we see the actual merger itself, which would sit nicely in the middle of the interferometer frequency spectrum. And these uh, dots along the line here indicate the uh, time before the merger. So uh, to take another example, here's a, a merger of two 30 mass solar mass black holes, which of course is observed very beautifully by LIGO Virgo Kagra. Uh, here is the infall regime. And uh, these dots here indicate that potentially with an atom interferometer, you could uh, observe the infall uh, hours, days, you know, potentially even months before the actual merger itself. And so that would enable you to issue an advance warning, not just to the gravitational wave detectors at higher frequencies, but also to the astronomical community. Uh, we would be able to predict you know, how far away, uh, what direction this would occur and when it would occur with a extremely high precision. Okay, so I, I mentioned uh, intermediate mass black holes. So as uh, I mentioned previously, uh, the black holes that have been observed merging by LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra are uh, down below 100 solar masses. Those in the centers of uh, galaxies weigh 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9 solar masses. So how do we get there from here? Well, maybe there were uh, population three stars that uh, died very early in the history of the universe, leaving behind perhaps black holes weighing a thousand solar masses, which would then be assembled like uh, tiny Lego bricks to make these supermassive black holes. Or maybe uh, you started off with uh, proto galaxies, which contained within them already black holes weighing perhaps 10,000, perhaps 100,000 solar masses, which then would merge to form the supermassive black holes. So you've got these two separate scenarios where you sort of use tiny Lego bricks or where you use larger Duplo bricks. Either way, you're going to have to have uh, mergers of black holes weighing of the order of 10 to 4, 10 to 5 solar masses. And these are the things that we're particularly interested in looking for. So here I show the uh, sensitivities to gravitational waves from such mergers. So we've got LIGO and ET over here on the left, got LISA here on the right. And in between here, I've got the first two stages of uh, Aeon, Aeon 100 and Aeon Kilometer. So each of these uh, shark's teeth is divided into two parts. Uh, in the light part, the detector observes the infall phase. And in the uh, shaded part, you observe the actual merger itself. So for example, if you're talking about uh, a merger of objects weighing 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 solar masses, you might be able to observe the infall phase with LISA, but the merger phase you'd observe with Aeon. Or uh, uh, you might observe the uh, infall stage with uh, ET and uh, the final merger, so, sorry, the info stage with Aeon and the final stage of a lighter merger with uh, the Einstein telescope or, or LIGO. So those are the laser, sorry, those are the atom interferometers on the ground, in the ground. And over here is a corresponding shark's tooth plot for the space-based version edge which would, uh, in a similar way, complement uh, Einstein telescope and uh, LISA operating in this intermediate frequency range. 
Now you notice these sensitivities go up to redshifts above 100. Of course, normally we'd not expect to see any astrophysical black holes at that distance. If you saw anything at all, that'd have to be a primordial black hole, which would be absolutely fascinating. Okay, so this uh, shows in more detail the sensitivity of a, a one kilometer detector. So now the shark's tooth, I've uh, eroded it somewhat with the effects of gravity gradient noise. So that's, of course, an issue for laser interferometers, as was also discussed by the previous speaker. For us, it's also a problem, not because uh, the shaking Earth shakes the mirrors, because we don't have physical mirrors, but it does shake the atoms themselves. The atom clouds are sensitive to seismic waves. And you need to mitigate this as best you can, uh, either uh, by uh, actively or, or passively by having a, a range of uh, seismometers around your vertical shaft. So this is something that we uh, studied for the uh, CERN possible location. So uh, the CERN engineers measured the uh, natural seismic vibrations, which is somewhere between the uh, Peterson high and uh, low noise models. There's uh, some diagonal variation. And then we looked at how this gravity gradient noise could be uh, mitigated by having a, a number of interferometers along the vertical shaft. And uh, this is illustrated here for the case of uh, gravitational waves, but uh, we're also interested in looking for ultralight dark matter like the previous speaker. And uh, here's some examples of sensitivities to uh, ultralight dark matter coupled to uh, electrons or photons or, or vector uh, dark matter. And uh, you can see here uh, the extent to which we can uh, mitigate the gravity gradient noise actively at the CERN site. Of course, a similar study would have to be done for other sites. It depends on the local geology. Uh, it's only at CERN that this has really been uh, measured carefully. So there was a question uh, during the previous speaker about uh, uh, the sensitivity of uh, other experiments. So for ultralight dark matter, uh, over much of the mass range, the most sensitive experiment is a uh, microscope, which was a space-borne uh, classical uh, equivalence principle test, uh, but there's also some constraints over here coming from uh, gravitational wave detectors. In particular, this vertical line here corresponds to the uh, earlier generation Alriga detector. So uh, in addition to uh, mergers of black holes, we've also considered other gravitational wave sources. A very interesting one is the gravitational memory following the passage of a gravitational wave produced by a supernova explosion. And uh, this is a little study that we did showing that you might be sensitive to uh, such gravitational memory effect if it occurred uh, within our galaxy. Okay, now let me come in my uh, final 10 minutes or so to uh, pulse our timing arrays. So uh, the way I like to uh, think of them is uh, the biggest bangs since the Big Bang. So here you see uh, what we imagine is being observed by the pulsar timing arrays. So we've got uh, two galaxies. You see here uh, there are halos and uh, there are black holes in the center. So uh, at the beginning of this year, we uh, did uh, a theoretical study of uh, merger rates, a very simple description of uh, the possible merger rate calculated using the extended press Schechter formalism, where you uh, have black holes situated inside uh, galaxies, inside galactic halos. Uh, so there's some function which describes the uh, occupation probability, and there's some other factor which describes the actual merger probability. And uh, you can parameterize the rate of mergers then by some overall product of these quantities that we call PBH. 
So then what we did was we uh, fitted this uh, simple model to the uh, IPTA uh, compilation of uh, data that was uh, available, uh, made available last year. And uh, this is the uh, picture which we came up with. We normalized PBH to the uh, signal that was consistent with the IPA data, assuming that you're actually seeing mergers of supermassive black holes losing energy by gravitational waves alone. We got a, a PBH, which was less than one. Uh, and uh, in this model, what they would be seeing would be mergers of black holes weighing more than 10 to nine solar masses. Now, if you go to higher frequencies, those mergers are no longer contributing to the gravitational wave background. Instead, the dominant contribution comes from uh, not quite so supermassive black holes. Those are the ones to which LISA would be most sensitive. And then down here on the right, uh, between 1,000 and 10 to the 6 solar masses, you have the intermediate mass black holes that we're interested in. And again, highlighted here in, in red is uh, the perspective sensitivity of uh, atom interferometers sitting in this uh, intermediate frequency band. So uh, as is well known, at very low frequencies, you expect to see uh, an ultra, uh, an unresolved background due to many sources. As you go to higher frequencies, this starts breaking up, gets the drastic variations due to uh, individual nearby sources. And uh, as we and others found, uh, the spectrum uh, over this range here is not well fitted by uh, a single power law. The statistical fluctuations, you could hope eventually to uh, distinguish individual sources, uh, measure polarization and isotropy and so on. So how could atom interferometers contribute to the uh, observation of such things? So this uh, simple model that we constructed, as I showed, it can be extrapolated to higher frequencies and therefore lower masses. And uh, here you see uh, the numbers of sources that on our model we would expect to see in uh, either LISA or, or EDGE, the space-borne version of our atom interferometer. And in that study that we did at the beginning of the year, uh, we estimated in this model that you would be able to see hundreds of mergers in LISA. You would also see hundreds of mergers in EDGE. They would have masses in this range, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 solar masses that I was talking about. And mergers that were seen by EDGE would have been seen previously by LISA uh, during their infall stage. And so by linking the two detectors together, you would really get a, a deep set of observations of these uh, supermassive black hole mergers. Five minutes. Okay. So thank you, five or five minutes. Of course, uh, having done all that, uh, we were hot to trot when uh, Nanograv and other PTA data uh, announced their results uh, last month. So here I show for the uh, nth time during this meeting, uh, the nanograph data. So uh, as is well known, those nanograph measurements are, are not in our priori perfect agreement with the idea that you're seeing supermassive black hole mergers where the supermassive black holes are losing energy by gravitational waves alone. It seems that there may be something else going on, uh, possibly interaction with the environment. And uh, this is illustrated here from uh, one of the nanograv papers, where here you see the amplitude gamma plane. This is what their observations indicate, and this is what they would have expected from the holodeck uh, simulation. And uh, we got similar results in our uh, very simple-minded uh, model. However, uh, the nanograv data, our priori, would be much better fit by a model in which those uh, black hole uh, binaries were losing energy uh, via environmental interaction as well as gravitational waves. And uh, well, 
This is a topic in which there are many experts in the audience. I'm not going to into it in, in great detail. What we did in a more recent paper, uh, following on from the nanograv uh, measurements, was we uh, constructed a simple model where we allow for energy loss uh, phenomenologically. Uh, we parameterize it you know, without any specific uh, environmental mechanism in mind. But uh, this is a sort of uh, general form that we assumed. And the effect of having this additional environmental energy loss is to uh, reduce the uh, amount of time that a binary radiates gravitational waves in a given frequency range. And uh, that obviously uh, changes the uh, spectrum in the direction which was apparently indicated by the nanograph data. So these are some results from uh, our analysis. Uh, I don't claim any originality here, but it's uh, interesting that uh, uh, if you include this environmental energy loss, or if you don't, uh, you get uh, the best chance of seeing an individual merger at a frequency uh, around uh, five nanohertz, and including environmental energy loss actually increases the number of such events which you might hope to see. And uh, this is a comparison that we did between uh, the nanograv violins and violins that we get from our simulation with gravitational wave only, the blue violins and including environmental effects, the green violins. And just by eye, you see that the environment fits better. Okay, I won't go through the details of this. Why do I go through all this if I'm an atom interferometer person? because this actually enhances the rates that you might expect for uh, seeing mergers at higher frequencies in the laser and edge range, because you require a larger probability for these mergers to take place. And so this enhances the uh, possible merger rates in laser or edge to of the order of a, a thousand per year. And it also starts giving you uh, events which should be detectable by a on one kilometer. So we've also looked at uh, an exotic uh, model, which is the merger of uh, cosmic strings. And uh, that could also fit uh, the nanograv data. Uh, so here I show you uh, some examples of uh, of cosmic string fits to the nanograv data. Interesting theory thing here is that they would give a spectrum which would extend to much higher frequencies with an essentially flat spectrum. And uh, we tried playing with that spectrum by postulating a period of matter domination during the expansion of the universe or a period of thermal inflation. No matter what we did to the expansion rate of the universe, in this cosmic string model, we would get events observable in our atom interferometers and also, of course, in, in LISA, although in this case, the uh, signal might be suppressed below the reach of uh, LIGO, VIGO, uh, CAGRA. So that brings me uh, to the end of what I wanted to say, except that uh, earlier on this year, we had a, a workshop uh, hosted by CERN, thinking about various different terrestrial, very long baseline atom interferometer projects. Uh, so the point of the workshop was to somehow coordinate international efforts in this direction with the idea of eventually, maybe sometime in the next decade, of uh, building one or more kilometer scale atom interferometers. Uh, we're in the process of uh, preparing a summary report on uh, these ideas, and our idea is to promote eventually a proto-collaboration to uh, really coordinate uh, possible construction efforts in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, really fascinating stuff. Uh, do we have any questions? If you have questions, either put your hand up or type them in the Q&A box. While we're waiting for the first questions to be typed, 
Um, John, I was wondering um, if you could just explain in tiny bit more detail the advantages or disadvantages of the, the vertical versus horizontal arrangement of the atom interferometers. I saw that there were a few being done horizontally, even though you suggested vertically was vertical superior. Uh, yeah, well, I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the people who uh, are promoting the horizontal uh, devices, uh, so, the, so we, we basically throw the atoms at our vertical shaft. So they have a horizontal shaft, uh, which is of the order of one meter, so they can't throw things so far. Uh, but they do have various techniques for trying to bounce the atoms backwards and forwards so they can uh, interrogate them many times. And they also rely on the idea of having more atom sources uh, along uh, their horizontal uh, tube so that they can uh, do many measurements at the same time. So we would not necessarily have so many uh, sources. Uh, they would perhaps have more sources and they'd have to play additional tricks in order to be able to uh, you know, bombard them as many times with their lasers. So I, I, personally, I, I feel that our strategy is, is cleaner, but uh, you know, if you had a proponent of MEGA here, he would convince you that I'm wrong. <laughs> cool. Um, I still haven't seen any questions pop up in the Q&A. Don't be shy, everybody. Feel free to ask questions. Um, the, I had another one though, if you're if you're willing to let me take my chair's prerogative again. Um, Please. <laughs> there was, can you give a, I was just wondering if you could give a sort of a good intuitive reason why you get a better chance of seeing the individual events um, in the PTA when there's environmental energy loss or and in the atom interferometry, why that? So, uh, how do we explain that? Well, I think I'm going to uh, pass on that. I'm not going to give you a, a detailed answer. Okay. But the fact that in our model, you have to enhance PBH so that you get more mergers because you observe them for a smaller amount of time. So, uh, when you're at low frequencies, uh, you, know, you still get this uh, unresolved stochastic background. But this means that you're more likely, when you go to higher frequencies, to get a merger which is relatively close by, uh, which you can hope to distinguish. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the way that I would think about it. Yep. Okay, great. Um, and since I don't see any other questions from the, the floor right now, I, I was wondering one last Thing potentially as a supernova person myself what does the uh, gravitational memory from a supernova signal actually look like uh so 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 what you are uh, postulating here is uh, an asymmetric uh supernova explosion we believe that generically supernova explosions are uh, anisotropic because we see pulsars with uh, with big kicks. So then what happens is that uh, the uh, uh, sort of neutrino uh, emission is anisotropic and also the gravitational wave uh, emission is, uh, is anisotropic. Now, the, the typical time scale of the supernova is actually at the order of uh, seconds, right? So in frequency space, that corresponds to Know, of the order of one hertz. So there is a, uh, so if you do the Fourier analysis of the uh, passing gravitational wave beam, it's actually somehow optimized at uh, around one hertz. Now the gravitational wave effect, of course, is that when a gravitational wave uh, goes by, uh, space-time is displaced. It's the same thing that uh, when a wave comes in, the flotsam on the surface of the water moves, okay. And the uh, the way in which the flotsam is moved uh, is given by this uh, characteristic frequency of the order of one hertz, and that's what we hope to observe. Fantastic.
Um, great. Okay. I think um, given there's no other questions, that's a good place to stop. It's been a really informative session. So thanks to all of the speakers um, from the morning and thanks very much to John for being our final speaker um, of the session. Um, really well, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tamara, for hosting. And uh, I've been following as many of the sessions as I could at this uh, somewhat remote location. And it's uh, all fascinating stuff. Thank you. Cool. Okay, signing off. Thanks all.